sergeants to if you would begin your recordings please computer recording started it's all recording started thank you gentlemen good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Sergeant, Committee on your recordings, please. Education. Computer recording. Pardon that. Uh, at this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following email. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's council at testimony, or testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Chair. Uh, very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning and welcome uh, to today's virtual hearing on the Department of Education's uh, changes in COVID protocols and implementation of the vaccine mandate. I'm Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee. The committee will also hear two pieces of legislation one focused on the number of COVID cases broken out by student, teacher, staff, administrator for each school, and the percentage of vaccinated persons broken out by student, teacher, staff, administrator for each school, and others to require DOE to report on school attendance data, vaccination, testing consent, and quarantine data. Uh, this past May, when Mayor de Blasio announced a full return uh, to in-person learning this September with no remote option for all students, teachers and staff in DOE schools. COVID was on the wane in New York City and throughout the nation. However, starting in June and continuing throughout the summer months, the far more contagious Delta variant was on the rise in the city as well as nationally, prompting the mayor to announce a mandate in late July that the entire city workforce, including DOE employees, would have to either get vaccinated by September 13th, the first day of school, or get tested for COVID once a week. Uh, as the threat from Delta increased on August, uh, one, one moment, forgive me, I'm getting that one second. Stand by, folks. We seem to be having some technical issue. Uh, can folks hear me? Okay. We hear you, Mr. Chair. My apologies. I just made sure I connected uh, the technology to, to charger so it doesn't, uh, I don't, so my apologies. I, I, I will be, begin again. Uh, I'll start from here. Um, it says here that this past May, when Mayor de Blasio announced a full return to in-person learning uh, this September with no remote option for all students, teachers and staff in DOE schools, uh, COVID was on the wane in New York City and throughout the nation. However, starting in June and continuing throughout the summer months, the far more contagious Delta variant was on the rise in the city, as well as nationally, prompting the mayor to announce a mandate in late July that the entire city workforce, including DOE employees, would have to either get vaccinated by September 13th, the first day of school, or get tested for COVID once a week. As the threat from Delta increased on August 23rd, the mayor, the chancellor and the health commissioner jointly announced a new mandate requiring all DOE employees 
to provide proof of first dose of vaccination by September 27th without an alternative option for weekly testing. The mandate initially applied to all 148,000 DOE employees, including school-based and central staff, as well as DOE contractors who work in school-based settings. But a few weeks later, was expanded to include all city contracted pre-K daycare and after-school workers who work in sites outside of public school buildings. I fully support the, va the vaccine mandate. Vaccinations are the first line of defense against the spread of COVID and protect the health and safety of students and staff alike. At the time the vaccine mandate was announced in August, 63% of DOE employees had at least one dose, according to the press release, which also contained the optimistic projection that this number will continue to, to increase uh, in the lead up to the first day of school and reach 100% by September 27th. And therein lies the issue. 100% compliance was never a realistic projection. There are always holdouts in every mandate in a system as large as ours, even if 1% of staff refused to be vaccinated, that would have been over a thousand employees. It is unacceptable that the city did not appropriately announce a plan for the likelihood that thousands of employees comprising an extremely small minority of staff would simply not comply, instead leaving principals, superintendents, and other administrators on the ground to once again scramble to implement the plan. It wasn't until weeks later, in the face of growing concerns of a potentially critical staff shortage, that the mayor declared uh, that there would be sufficient numbers of substitute teachers and central DOE staff who could fill in for any unvaccinated classroom teacher. But he provided no numbers at the time. Further, neither he nor anyone from the administration mentioned plans to replace other unvaccinated workers, including power professionals, custodial staff, school safety agents, and school food workers, titles which comprise the most acute staffing gaps that principals now face. The strategy of establishing a deadline for vaccinations clearly succeeded in prompting more staff to get vaccinated. And the extension to October 1st, resulting from core challenges finding the mandate enforceable, convinced even more. The latest information we have is that 95% of all full-time employees have received at least one vaccine dose, including 99% of principals, 96% of teachers, 92% of school food workers, and 82% uh, of school safety agents, although that, that number might have gone up in recent days. That still leaves about 8,000 employees that have refused to be vaccinated and have been placed on unpaid leave. In the past week, the mayor has stated that the city has a reserve of about 9,000 substitute teachers and another 5,000 substitute power professionals who are vaccinated, but it is unclear what preparation has been provided to the substitutes and whether they will remain in classrooms permanently, raising questions about the impact on the quality of instruction and services for students. As yet, no replacement plans have been revealed for any custodial staff, school food workers, or school safety agents. So we hope to hear more uh, today about how vacancies in these positions will be handled. However, many principals throughout the city have also shared with me that there is a disconnect between the plans for the substitute staff uh, that have been announced and the actual implementation in schools. These principals are saying that they have not yet seen any of the staff that they have requested, especially paraprofessionals, which leaves many students with disabilities without needed support. One school I spoke with lost 10 paraprofessionals. The point of the vaccine mandate is to keep our schools healthy and safe having many students with, with disabilities go uh, without legally mandated supports is antithetical uh, to that. The DOE must immediately work with schools to address these gaps, whether through substitutes or through expediting the approval of nominations by principals. And I wanna note principals that I've spoken with have in fact sent nomination letters to hire new people and they're still waiting for those letters and those applications to be processed. At the end of the day, much of this disruption could have been avoided if the vaccine uh, had been mandated by the start of the school year rather than a few weeks in. The vaccine mandate is also creating issues for many early childhood uh, centers and after school providers, which already struggle to find and keep staff because the pay is so low. Some center directors have said that if forced to exclude all unvaccinated staff, 
they would have to close, potentially leaving thousands of young children without childcare. We hope to get an update today on the status of these centers. Busing is another area of great concern because school bus drivers are in close contact with students. We've heard a number of anecdotal reports from parents and advocates that many uh, bus drivers are not enforcing mask wearing for students on the bus. I have significant concerns about uh, changes to quarantine protocols. While I recognize that they are all in line with CDC's guidance, they once again reflect a significant disconnect from realities on the ground. The reality is that not all students wear their masks correctly uh, all day or maintain three feet distance from others, especially in overcrowded schools. This creates a massive burden on educators and administrators to engage in uh, contact tracing activities, checking rosters and seating charts, interviewing parents and students at the expense of teaching and learning. Imagine being a teacher in a classroom and trying to teach while simultaneously tracking 30 bodies to see whether they are too close or properly masked. It is ludicrous uh, on its face. I have spoken with administrators who are on the phone with the Situation Room until 11 p.m. at night. All of this is made more complicated because of the ambiguity on how three feet of distance is measured. There are reports that the DOE is measuring three feet from the center of one desk to the center of the adjacent desk, effectively nose to nose. And we have a graphic up uh, to, to, to show. Malcolm, uh, could you please show the photo? And, and yeah, thank you, Malcolm, for, for that. For people with visual impairments, we are now showing a photo of two classroom desks with a yardstick extending from the center of one desk to the center of the adjacent desk, measuring three feet. The space between the two desks is too small for an adult to pass comfortably between the desks. And take it from me, I am a former teacher. That, is, that space is too small. I hope the administration will provide definitive clarity today on what its standard is for measuring three feet of distance. Another change in protocols this year has to do with COVID testing and consent. Last year, DOE tested 20% of students and staff in each school on a weekly basis, and all students who attended in person had to have signed a consent form. Prior to school reopening this year, DOE announced that every school would test just 10% of unvaccinated students on a biweekly basis. But at the end of the first week, the mayor increased testing frequency to weekly once again. However, students are no longer required to submit uh, cons consent forms in order to attend school this year, which raises questions about how many students are actually being tested, which is based on the number who have voluntarily returned consent forms. I will again note that the Los Angeles School District has made weekly testing mandatory for all people in school buildings, and I hope that we will follow suit with the, uh, the continuation of the, the, the rise of, of Delta and the move away from classroom closures, surveillance and trend uh, testing is not an effective way uh, of keeping everyone in buildings safe. Additional concerns include a lack of data and transparency around enrollment and attendance. Currently, DOE does not report actual numbers of students attending, rather they post a daily attendance as a percentage of students enrolled in, in each school and a citywide total percentage, even though uh, some schools have not yet reported attendance, which can be misleading. We don't even know what the total enrollment number is citywide this year, since there are reports that many students have left the system since the start of the COVID pandemic. There are reports that many parents who are concerned about the prospect of their children contracting COVID have declined to send their children back to school thus far, continuing to call for a remote option instead. To date, DOE has not commented on how many students have not shown up to school at all this year, reinforcing the need for accurate attendance numbers. We have heard that the number is around 150,000. If that's incorrect, I... I would love to, for the DOE to, to correct and clarify the record today. Well, that may seem like a small number in the scale of DOE, that is more students than are in the Philadelphia school system, which incidentally offers a remote option. At today's hearing, the committee hopes to get answers to these and many other questions in order to get a better understanding of current conditions facing students and staff in schools. We also look forward to hearing details about how the department plans to address staffing shortages 
resulting from the vaccine mandate across all positions. And if the administration plans to redeploy central staff to fill school level positions, we want to hear what impact that will have on central services and operations. I wanna thank everyone who is testifying today. I wanna to thank the city council staff for all their work. Uh, Malcolm Buterhorn, Jen Atwell, Aaliyah Reynolds, Chelsea Bademore, uh, Macis Sarkissian. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, my policy director, Vanessa Ogle, and director of communications, uh, Maria Henderson. I just wanna also note the council members that uh, are, are, are in attendance so far that we have. Um, Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Dinowitz, Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Gradenchik, Councilmember Emperor Samuel, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Brennan, Councilmember Drum, Councilmember Lander, and forgive me if, if I've missed anyone, we'll, we'll uh, uh, add them uh, with, with shortly. And uh, with that, Malcolm, we can now hear uh, testimony. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Malcolm Butehorn, counsel to the Education Committee. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, a member of our staff will unmute you. Zoom will prompt you a message to accept the unmute. For the public, I will be calling on public witnesses to testify in panels after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and council member questions. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. Council members who have questions should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. And for purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be having a second round. For panelists and the public, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, we ask that uh, panelists please wrap up their comments so we can move on to the next person. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify and be available for questions and answers. Donald Conyers, first deputy chancellor, Department of Education. LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor of School Climate and Wellness, Department of Education. Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer, Department of Education. Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner, Department of Buildings, Director of the Situation Room. Dr. Easterling, First Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And Dr. Long, Executive Director, New York City COVID-19 Test and Trace Corps and Senior Vice President of Ambulatory Care and Population Health at New York City Health and Hospitals. I will first read the oath, and after I will call on each of you individually to respond. If you could please raise your right hands. Do you refer to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? First, D.C. Conyers? I do. D.C. Robinson? Yes, I do. Lauren Siciliano? Yes. Commissioner LaRocca? Yes. Dr. Easterling? Yes, I do. And Dr. Long? I do. First Deputy Chancellor Conyers, whenever you are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, Chair Traeger and all the members of the Education Committee that are here today. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Department of Education's COVID-19 protocols and the implementation of the vaccine mandate. As you know, I'm Donald Conyers, first Deputy Chancellor uh, at the Department of Education, and I'm joined here by my colleagues, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Chief Administrative Officer L Lauren Siciliano, Dr. Ted Long, the Executive Director of New York City's Test and Trace Corp., and Dr. Easterling, First Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Health and Mental uh, mental hygiene, and Commissioner Melanie LaRocca from the building, uh, Department of Buildings. I want to take a moment to really talk, to, to talk a little bit about my continued story and the story of the Department of Education. Um, this school opening this past September um, uh, marked 50 years of school openings for me. 12 of those years as a, a student 
of, of the Department of Education and 38 of them as a servant in the Department of Education of which I'm very proud to be here for these 50 years. We have over the course of that period of time gone through all kinds of iterative, iterative and developmental changes, progress, progress being made, uh, new findings, new understandings, new commitments, relationships, and in a system as large as this, where there is no perfect um, solution yet. We strive every day for perfection. We strive every day for excellence. And I wanna take this moment to really remind everyone of the enormity of not having our students in school with us, in buildings where they are safe, where we have capitalized on all the things that we know as educators and all the things that we know as health um, practitioners and everything that we know about making sure that our students can have memorable, secure and healthy moments in this educative experience that we, that we are uh, providing for them to fulfill the promises of education that I stepped into 38 years ago as a servant. So I wanna take a moment to mention how exhilarating it's been um, to experience the reopening of our buildings all across the city. Over the past month, we've all had the privilege of witnessing students, families, and our invaluable staff joyfully, and I do mean joyfully, reconnect with one another. And the evidence continues to be clear, and I will say it, so many times as much as I have to, that teaching and learning face-to-face, -face, in person, in classrooms is the absolute best way for our students to grow academically and socially and with the confidence that they need as independent leaders of their own lives. We're so thrilled to have them back all five days every week, and we're really happy about that. We are not simply picking up where we left off when the pandemic forced school buildings to close in March of 2020. We are moving and taking more action, learning from experiences, making adjustments, and ensuring that we are following the guidance and making the strongest and most confident decisions that align with the values that we have about making sure that our students are whole, 100%, not just academically, but also in terms of their mental health and social emotional um, wellness. We have support systems in place that are helping our students to cope with the trauma they've been through and our health and safety protocols of which I'm very proud of, as we've been the gold standard for the nation, leading in terms of how we have installed and, and put in place health and safety standards that really optimize and maximize the health and safety of all of our constituents in this school community. So our health and safety protocols, you'll continue to hear. I'm going to keep going back to that. We led with that uh, when the pandemic started. We were, we were clear about the health and safety being foundational and very important. We also continue to make sure that as we add to that, we, we move through the iterative progress and progression that comes as a result of the changes in the environment, changes in, in uh, results and changes in uh, uh, the guidance that we're offered. But we are certainly always, always pushing health and safety first. So health and safety for our students and staff has always been the priority. I mean, I'll continue to say it. Last year, we were the first, as I mentioned, um, major school district to open our doors for in-person learning. And we created that gold standard approach to health and safety during the pandemic, which has served this nation and certainly our great city of New York. Schools were some of the safest places to be in the city. And we ended last year with just a 0.03% seven day average positivity rate. And we know from our experiences that last school year and over the summer with our summer rising, which was a great, great start for bridging and bringing our students back into the school year, um, what, what works? We know what works for our children and our families and staff. And that's exactly what we're continuing to do. And uh, Chair, I am not naive enough to believe that um, every step that we take and every move that we make, we're going to make everyone happy. We are endeavoring to make this city safe, to educate as many of our students, all our students. But we are making, and as you know, as a leader, decisions that we make, we make decisions to ensure that we can bring along as many and as most and all people and all constituents that we serve. So heading into this school year, we knew that we had to continue a highly effective multi-layered approach to health and safety. But we also recognize that the amazing vaccines 
that have now become our strongest tool in this fight against COVID-19. That is why we ensure that every school serving students age 12 and over provided vaccinations on site during the first week of school. We also led the way among U.S. school districts in mandating vaccinations for all the Department of Education school-based and central employees. That mandate has clearly worked. It clearly has worked. And it is also a decision that adults went into with both eyes open, fully cognizant of its value and the ability to change the nature of how we do schooling for our students, keeping them the safest that we can. So over 95% of the full-time de Department of Education employees were vaccinated and more than 43,000 injected shots have been given out since the mandate was announced. Breaking that down further, 99% of principals have been vaccinated, 96% of teachers, 92% of our paraprofessionals, and 92% of our valuable and valued school food workers, and over 90% of our custodians. This means all, or that our, all our employees and staff members are doing their part to keep their communities safe. Thanks to the vaccination mandate, New York City schools remain some of the safest places across the city to be. So I'm enormously grateful to every educator, every food service provider, every school safety agent, every administrator, substitute, every custodial worker, and every other employee who stepped up and, and took this vital step to keep our students safe. We are working together with our schools to provide every resource we can to ensure their needs are met. That includes thousands of vaccinated substitutes. With more teachers and paraprofessionals joining that pool of available sub every day. We are also providing schools with increased funding to support the cost of additional staffing needs due to the vaccination mandate, while working closely with them to ensure continuity of instruction and day to day school life. One benefit of being the largest school district in the nation is that we have the largest village of dedicated adults prepared to step up for our young students. The vaccine mandate is a critical component of our multi-layered uh, CD, CDC aligned protocols that we are keeping our schools safe with and running smoothly with. These include mandatory masking, maintaining distance, enhanced ventilation, testing, daily screening requirements, and also the education of our young people as to the importance of it, the establishments of routines, how they move about, how they stay safe. So from the beginning of this pandemic, we have been continually learning and adapting to circumstances, as well as listening to the guidance of our trusted health experts. Being nimble in order to do what is best for our students has been essential to navigating these unprecedented times. To this end, we recently changed our quarantine policy to align with CDC guidance. When a positive COVID-19 case is confirmed in a classroom, we no longer automatically close that classroom, provided everyone has remained masked and maintained at least three feet of distance from whomever has tested positive. That change ensures that our students are able to remain learning in person in their classrooms safely. In addition, we increased our testing frequency to weekly from biweekly and have the capacity to deploy additional resources where they may be needed. As always, we will continue to make adjustments as needed to respond to the data we constantly gather so that our school buildings remain the safest places to be in the city. Everyone throughout our entire school system has been hard at work to make our, our first day of school in this school year, this memorable school year, our homecoming safe and successful. Thanks to the multi-tiered approach that combines vaccinations, ventilation, man, mask mandates, enhanced cleaning techniques, testing, our situation room that operationalizes quarantine, quarantine and closure policies, and all, and all signs to date indicate that our system is working. We again are educating and reinforcing with our students and our staff the importance of taking the steps that they need to take to maintain um, safe and wellness. Students, as you know, Chair, are become uh, those that are respond to routine patterns. They also respond to rules. They understand that we have the ability as teachers, you and I were teachers, to ensure that we uh, 
continue to inculcate and also explain the why of why we're doing certain things and the importance. So again, I'm grateful to every staff member, many of whom work around the clock and continue to work around the clock, striving to make this year safe and successful as our school communities reconnect. I want to thank you for your time, and I'll be happy, along with my esteemed uh, colleagues, to answer as many questions that you have today. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, just confirming we're not hearing any additional opening statements. Is that correct? Is that just from DOE? That's correct. Just uh, first deputy chancellor testifying. Right. So you can now go to your questions. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Deputy Chancellor, and to all those who uh, joined us today uh, on the hearing. Um, I want to actually just first direct some questions to the uh, to the health department, um, and I do have obviously questions for, for DOE as well. Um, Dr. Easterling, De Deputy Commissioner, thank you for your uh, attendance here today. I just wanted just to certain, get certain things on the record. Um, New York City, our five boroughs, our five counties, we remain in a high transmission area for the Delta variant. Is that correct? So what I can say is, uh, and the data has been, um, you know, moving in the downward uh, trajectory. Uh, we are seeing changes in our transmission level. Just for everyone's awareness, CDC has categorized transmission as being high, substantial, moderate, and low. Uh, and so we are seeing in a number of days that we move from high to substantial transmission, meaning that our cases are actually between 100 and 50 per, and 50 per day, which is really good. And we are seeing uh, that improvement also happening uh, in some of the boroughs as well. So I would actually say that we are seeing a, a downward trend uh, in, in the direction of our COVID cases uh, and stabilizing in our hospitalizations. And I don't think there's anyone that would disagree that we want to get to zero. We want everyone to be healthy and safe and to move on. But just to answer Absolutely. my question, yes, uh, clearly, uh, are we still classified at this moment as a, in, in a high transmission state? Um, just, just to be clear, so when you say high, the category would be substantial. Um, substantial. So, substantial. so we're still classified yes. in, a, in a substantial category, is that correct? Now substantial transmission level, yes. Right. And... And just again, for the record, the Delta variant is more contagious than the original uh, COVID virus. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes, the Delta variant is more transmissible, uh, can cause more severe illness compared to the classic COVID or SARS-CoV-2. Right, and the Delta variant um, has, as we've seen reports and data, uh, has had an impact on young children, particularly kids who are not of vaccination age. Is that correct? Um, I think that, that uh, we're still looking at the data. Uh, and what we know uh, is that certainly with the Delta variant, because it can cause uh, greater transmission uh, and uh, hospitalizations, we're certainly concerned about the most vulnerable, particularly those with underlying chronic conditions and uh, with um, uh, our elder, our older population. And I think this is certainly because we know that due to uh, immune evasion uh, and lack of antibodies, we know that things can change over time. Uh, now, related to transmission, um, we're going to start to see, um, you know, certainly higher cases among uh, younger children, as we know that um, at, is going towards and directed towards individuals that are unvaccinated. And so that's why it's really important that we increase our vaccination rates uh, for those that are eligible. Uh, but just for the record, Dr. Yustowing, uh, the uh, Dr. Fauci, who is, uh, you know, um, I think in many respects still a respected national health leader, uh, recently stated that in some respects, the government maybe underestimated the impact of Delta's impact on young children. H have you heard that? Yeah, I, I have heard that, and certainly uh, Dr. Felty is certainly respected in the field, so I, I would agree with you there. Um, and I've also heard the statement uh, as well. Um, and, but I also know that, um, you know, sometimes uh, things are taken out of context, uh, and so it's, it's really important that we continue to look at the whole picture, um, and certainly we continue to look at all age populations. I think there are certain categories that we are continuing to be concerned about. Our older population, yes, our younger population, and certainly uh, those with underlying chronic conditions. Okay. Uh, 
Dr. Easterling, we, uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, um, we we held we held a hearing on September first where the health commissioner uh, testified, uh, uh, you know, with us uh, that he was very much a part of the team that came up with the original health and safety protocols for our schools, for our schools, where the, the guidance, the rules uh, stated that if there was one positive case uh, in an uh, elementary school class where there's, the young children are not vaccinated, that the entire class would be shifted to remote or you know, would have to quarantine for 10 days and that there would be uh, instruction, live instruction for them remotely. And he defended it uh, pretty strongly calling this, you know, the gold standard, that this is what he believed in. And quite frankly, even prior to the hearing, I had a, a briefing Zoom with senior health officials defending, standing by that policy as the gold standard. Tell me, Deputy Commissioner, uh, what changed after just one week that we went from a policy of moving the class uh, one positive case in elementary school class, shifting to remote to now uh, a very, uh, I would argue, uh, a very more ambiguous dynamic that many schools are, are, are telling me about on a daily basis. But what, just tell me from your words, were you a part of the team that came up with the original policy and what changed after one week? Yeah, so certainly um, I'm always in, in conversation with our commissioner. Uh, we have been a part of the meetings. This is a very much a unified front. Um, two things, and I, and I certainly remember uh, the conversation. The commissioner was clear. We're always looking at the data and it's really important that we continue to do so. And the commissioner uh, made that clear also in the hearing. Uh, and then two, uh, with the announcement of the original quarantine policy, we knew that it always had to be layered in with a strategy to ensure that we um, included all of the other mitigation strategies that we know that work. And so the protocols related to masking, maintaining distance, enhanced ventilation, those are always a foundation. Uh, and I think that as we have continued to look at the data, we knew that this was an opportunity to really align with CDC guidance, um, which we always wanted to, uh, you know, we all, I think we always understood that this was really important that we do. Uh, and I think Commissioner, that, uh, uh, respectfully, Sure. Within one week, you the, the health team said that this policy is not working effectively, and you change who, what changed? I mean, what specifically can you point to that said we need to now scrap this gold standard or policy and move to something else? Could, could what is what is the data point that said that you that struck you as a health professional that said, this is not working for, for our school system? Again, if, if not one data point, again, I think it's the items that I've already laid out, looking at the data, ensuring that we're aligning with all the other protocols and ongoing conversations around how our policy is going to make sure that we're gonna to continue to keep our kids safe, keep them in school, making sure that they are engaged in a safe learning environment. And I think that this quarantine policy continues to do so. Um, and so I think that we, we always want to give ourselves some room that there will be changes that will allow us to keep you know, make sure that we're keeping our kids safe in the community safe. And Deputy Commissioner, would you agree that changing the policy after defending the original one for weeks that, or, or for a period of time that it's the gold standard, do you, do you, do you agree that that could impact trust that the public has in, 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 in the health and safety protocols? Uh, changing it not even a week past the first week of school? Um, you know, I think it's really important that we do continue to make sure that we're messaging, uh, that we're clearly outlining the ways in which we are uh, making these decisions around our policy, around health and safety. And the gold standard are those three ways, looking at our data, making sure that we're communicating really effectively, and we have a really robust strategy. And that multi-layer strategy is the gold standard. And we're gonna just continue to do so to make sure that parents know that we wanna keep our kids safe and our staff safe as well. Let's, let's take a deeper look at the multi-layered strategy. Uh, Malcolm, can you put back up on the screen the, uh, the photograph of, the, of how the DOE measures three feet? 
Uh, it'll take just a moment. I have to pull it back up. So sure. Uh, well, Deputy Commissioner. Talking, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have a chance to look at the photograph I shared earlier on, which Malcolm will put back on momentarily? This is a question for the for the health com uh, commissioner for Dr. Easterling. Did you have a chance during my opening statement to look at the photograph I shared? Well, here it is. Here it is now. Sorry. Yes, I did see the picture. Right. So it is my understanding that the Department of Education, in which I'll be questioning them shortly, measures three feet from nose to nose, from center of the desk to center of the desk. And Dr. Easterling, I'm going to put my teacher hat on now. I was a teacher. Um, I could tell you that it would be a challenge for me to even get through that space between these two desks. In your professional opinion, as a doctor, as a public health official, do you believe that that is sufficient space when we talk about a multi-layered multi gold standard package? In your view, is that, a, is that sufficient space between two students? Yeah, what, what I can say is I know that this is um, the process that our, I, I know that my DOE colleagues um, will speak to about how they are ensuring uh, to keep three feet. Um, I do not know this specific example, um, and I know that you're showing the picture, uh, but again, I think it's, it's important for us to be able to lay out the process in order to ensure that we are maintaining three feet in the spaces, particularly in classrooms and cafeterias, um, and I think that my DOE colleagues will, will make sure to give you more details there. Well, let's just say you see this picture. Does that look sufficient to you? Does that look like sufficient social physical distance between two uh, two students. Uh, I, you know, I, I again, I don't, I don't know the exact details on which your um, uh, how it's being laid out. But again, my DOE colleagues can really speak to more detail there. Well, I could tell you, I am not a doctor or a public health official. As an educator, I would not have enough space to walk through those two desks, um, and it is my understanding that that is how they're now measuring three feet distance between students from nose to nose, center of a desk to center of a desk. Um, instructionally, that's not good. And I could tell you that, you know, as far as a person being able to walk through the space, but as far as public health, that to me does not look like adequate physical distance. And what that allows the DOE to do, uh, which I'll get to momentarily, is to fit more desks into, into, into spaces because we have overcrowded schools and classrooms. And that is, in my opinion, not a part of a gold standard multi-layered approach to keep students, staff, and schools safe. Uh, that actually puts kids and staff at risk of not being in compliance with CDC guidance because it's my understanding that what allowed the administration to make the change after one week was saying that, look, we're complying with CDC guidance. I read the guidance. The guidance states that that is as long as you are maintaining, you know, safe physical distance throughout the day and, and masking throughout the day, which is a whole other conversation. That, in my opinion, is not adequate, uh, safe uh, three feet physical uh, distance. Uh, I, I want, please go ahead. This is Ted. I, I don't. I, I'm. I'm. Didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I have sure. a few thoughts if I might be able to jump in. Absolutely, please. Um, so. With the CDC guidance, um, the way it reads is that if you have two students, one's a case and one is a student sitting next to the case and either in any direction, uh, if they're more three feet or more apart than the, if they're both wearing masks, then the immediate person, that's the ruler on the, you know, either side of what the picture you just showed would not per the CDC be considered a close contact. But in addition to that, in the picture, even outside of the, um, of the immediate zone in the picture that you showed, what this the CDC is also saying is that if you look at if the bottom left student is a case, the student 10 seats backwards in our previous policy, we would have been quarantining, whereas now, even if we want to talk about the, the student immediately next to the case, uh, we previously were quarantining a, the student 10 seats backwards, whereas now we would not be because um, we per CDC that student is so far back that it's unlikely that they were uh, going to be transmitted the virus by the student you know, 10 seats forward at the front of the classroom. So there's the two pieces of the CDC guidance I just wanted to be clear about that I think are important. And as we evaluate with contact tracing, we look at both of those different scenarios, both seeing who is 
three feet meeting that criteria with reliable mask wearing, but also who else is in the classroom that might, um, that if they're low risk, uh, would benefit from being able to come uh, for continued in-person education every day, whereas previously that was not the case. Uh, but, but Dr. Wong, in, in, in your professional opinion as a public health official, um, does that look, to, in your opinion, to be sufficient space between two students? I mean, I understand you're talking about cases. I'm talking about multi-layered strategy to keep kids and staff safe says, one part of it says safe physical distance of, of at least three feet. Does that look to you, in your opinion, the way they're measuring? First of all, are you aware? Let me take a, take a step back. Are you aware that the DOE is measuring three feet from nose to nose, center of a desk to center of a desk? Are you aware of that? Yes, we're aware of it. Um, and uh, we've discussed this with DOE, both Test and Trace and the Department of Health. And when you're looking at CDC, and I have their guidance in front of me, the exact quote is, um, the close contact definition excludes students who are between three to six feet of an infected student. So you need to make a determination of what that three feet is. CDC does not say anything about measuring, for example, from the side of the desk to the side of the desk. They look at their unit as the student or, an, or a person three feet from another person. Um, so if you're looking to, de to determine what's three feet between two individuals, nose to nose is, I think, a reasonable way to do that. One thing you said, though, which is really important, and I, I, I want to really emphasize this, is that's all contingent on there being appropriate and consistent mask wearing throughout the day. This all is not does not apply if we can't confirm definitively that the students were both wearing masks appropriately. And that's why the multiple layers of protection really matter. It's not just testing that will prevent transmission in our schools. It's a, important, it's a pillar, but it's about mask wearing. It's about making sure the distancing is appropriate there. It's about ventilation. Um, it's about everything else that we've done in totality across. Um, so I just wanted to make the point that uh, you bring up a really, really important point there, though, that it's not just about what the ruler shows there. It's about confirming all those other things in order to say that we uh, we believe um, that this is uh, that the CDC guidance here is applicable. So, I mean, I it, it is it is quite something for us to even have a conversation of how we're measuring three feet. But I could tell you, Dr. Wong, that uh, that. This photograph does not instill confidence for me, and I'm sure for those many of those who are watching. Um, as an educator, I'm sharing I'm sharing with you that that would not even be sufficient space for me to walk through a class. And part of being a teacher is, you know, proximity, walking around the room, checking in on students' work. That would be a challenge for me to even get through. So, as an educator, I could tell you that that's quite a bit of a challenge, but. If a parent or someone's watching, looking at this photograph, um, this does not instill confidence that kids are adequately, safely, physically distancing. And this allows the department to fit more desks into, into spaces, which I think uh, causes greater, greater concern. But I want to move on because we're a part of this multi-layered approach. Um, let's get to the testing. Um, can someone report to me now the number of testing consent forms that the city of New York is in receipt is in receipt of at, at this moment? This is Ted. I'll defer to DOE on the consent forms. I do. I can share with you any of the testing data about tests we performed, number of positive people we found. Well, but I'll defer to Dr. Wong. I, I just. It's a very specific question because I, I asked this question quite a bit, and we still have not really gotten an answer. Um, how yes. many testing consent forms do we have to date? Uh, Chair, we have 192,705 consent forms to date. So, uh, so you said 192,000, how many? 705. 705. On, on file. And on file. And yes. Deputy Chancellor, does that number include consent forms from last year? No, it does not. Uh, those consent forms from last year, they have expired. Is that correct? That is correct, Chair. And uh, 192,705. And how many students do we have enrolled in the school system at, at this time? Well, we are we are going to be doing our, our preliminary audit as of October 31st, and then our, our final audit in the spring. So I, I don't have that number to give you. 
So, Deputy Chancellor, I I just want to look. You're, you're you're an educator. You've you've climbed the ranks. I congratulate you, to the Deputy Chancellor, and you've been very responsive to me and gotten back to me. I I can't buy this as an answer. I'm very familiar with October. I'm very familiar with the October register. Those numbers are for budgetary reasons for schools. About if a kid shows up at least once in the month of October, the school gets money for that student during that month. The DOE still knows how many kids they have in their system. If you're telling me that the DOE does not magically know now, that is just unfathomable to me. That is, I, I cannot accept this as, a, as, a, as an answer. So I'm gonna ask again, respectfully, how many students do we have currently enrolled in our public school system? And I will respectfully say to you that I don't have that number to give you at this moment, Chair. I've given you our practice, what we do, vis-a-vis -vis October 31st, and then our final audit. And I don't have that number at this moment to give you. So this is, this is why we're moving in the direction of uh, uh, passing bills and legislation to require the reporting of information. Uh, because this, this should be basic. This is not, this shouldn't be controversial, quite frankly. Um, the fact that we don't share how many kids are enrolled in our school system right now is unacceptable to me. And, and also, quite frankly, further erodes trust with the public. Um, because you, you shared with me a number of 192,705. Uh, if we use data from previous school years, over a million kids or, or so, uh, these are not very reassuring numbers. Uh, I also want to share with you that um, there are some schools I hear from school principals that have over 150, oh, I'm sorry, over 1,500 students where under 100 kids have returned their consent forms that they haven't even met the 10% threshold. Can you share with me whether 100% of our schools have met the 10% threshold for testing? Well, we're gonna to have to get back to you on that data. If you're asking for uh, schools that have, that have surpassed or met the 10% threshold, I don't have that data in front of me, Chair. So, we, 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 we need this information, the Deputy Chancellor, and I just go back to Dr. Easterling, Dr. Long, as part of your multi-layered gold standard package, look, look at what's happening here. Um, we don't know if all of our schools have met the threshold of, of at least 10%. Um, I shared with you that in one school I've, I've been in touch with, under 10%. 10% have met uh, that threshold where they can't adequately test the number of kids needed. Um, well, we, please go ahead. I'm sorry to cut the crush. This is part of our campaign that we are every day encouraging parents and students to step up to and parents to sign that consent. It is not something that we are overlooking. We are pushing every day. This, of course, we need parental consent to sign for the consent uh, to acknowledge for the testing and where we are uh, finding resistance, we continue to push. Therefore, uh, I can't give you a number today and, and I realized what you're pushing and asking for um, and it's important, but I don't have a number to give you, but I can tell you that we are continuing our consent campaign along with our vaccination campaign so that we can also meet one of the pillars in our multi-layered approach. Deputy Chancellor, the number 192,705, uh, these are the students that return consent forms this year, you said. Um, are, are all of these students unvaccinated? Yes, it's a part of the, and I'll ask um, uh, uh, Commissioner LaRocca if she speaks to that, but the question is, answer is yes to that. All right, so, th so these, all these uh, kids, students who return the forms, these are all unvaccinated, is that correct? As a part of the, yes, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, will you step in? Sure, if you wouldn't mind just restating the question, Chair, I apologize. Sure, Commissioner. So the question is, uh, the Deputy Chancellor testified that 192,705 192, students to date 
have returned a testing consent form back to the administration, allowing them to get tested in schools. The question I asked, are all of these students who return these consent forms, are all of them unvaccinated students? Sure, I, as far as I understand, yes, but Ted, please uh, correct me or one of, uh, Dr. Easterling, please correct me if I uh, am wrong. I, I, I'd like to bring my doctors in here. Nothing to add, sir. Could, is, are, are, so I'm sensing that there's some folks that think this is right or not sure this is right. Can anyone just no, clarify it, for the record? it is absolutely correct. The, those that, the consent forms are those that are unvaccinated. That is correct. Uh, how many, uh, do, we, do we have a number? I, I asked this question at the hearing on September 1st. Uh, how many uh, DOE students who are of vac vaccination age, how many of them are vaccinated at, at this time? Um, in terms of the students, I would say citywide, we're about like 74% uh, of our students uh, 12 and up. At the age of so, Deputy Chancellor, what, last time I asked this oh, question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sure, I'm sure. Go ahead. The citywide uh, vaccination rate is 74%. That is what right. it is. Right. And that's sort of the similar answer we got in the last hearing, but that did not really give us a picture of the DOE. Um, it's, you know, now families have had an opportunity or should have an opportunity, and, and the system should have been encouraging them to uh, go on to the online portal, which there's still some questions and issues about, um, to indicate vaccination status of their child. Um, so can you share with us how many DOE students have been vaccinated? All DOE right, I'm students. Going, I'm going to call in Lauren Siciliano to support with that. Lauren? Bear with us one moment, we're going to unmute her. Okay, thank you. Yep. There we go. Morning, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for uh, giving us an opportunity to talk about the work that we are doing to keep our students and our staff safe. So in terms of the uh, vaccination data for students, you're absolutely correct that parents can upload to the vaccination portal proof of vaccination for their student, obviously for, for students who are old enough to get vaccinated. Um, that data though that principals receive uh, for the school is really used for two primary purposes. It's for students who are participating in PSAL or students who uh, need to participate in other high risk activities, um, other high risk extracurricular activities that require vaccination. So that information is not a complete um, picture of the, the vaccination rate for students. Um, so that's so, why in terms of the, uh, the total percentages, that's why we use the city numbers. So Warren, last time we had a hearing, mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned that the city has this data two ways. Number one, through what they indicate through an online portal. Number two, you cross check it with a central database that the Situation Room and others have access to. Do, do, do you recall that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Things? And that is absolutely accurate, yes. Right. So as of this moment, having your two sets of data, how many DOE students are vaccinated? Not citywide, just DOE students. Yeah. Um, so the with those two data sets that, I, that you're talking about, there are still students who aren't captured there because the the city database only captures students uh, if they were vaccinated well outside of New York City they wouldn't be captured there so uh, the data that we're pulling in even though it's incomplete it's still extraordinarily useful to principals for the two purposes that I mentioned but it's not a comprehensive picture of the the total vaccination right. rate. Warren I, I appreciate that I just I would love an answer to the question how many DOE students are vaccinated right now? 
I don't have that number aggregated up at the central level because we were giving it out school by school, um, but I'm happy to take that question back and follow up. You see, this this is you know this is critical information for a number of reasons. Number one, to be a part of a multi-layered approach to keep kids and staff safe, but this is also about uh, in, instilling trust and confidence from parents and school communities. And the fact that you don't have today basic information um, available to the committee and to the public, it, it's just, this is just not acceptable. Um, and I also have to say uh, that when I asked before about whether or not all of the students who return the consent forms, whether or not these are all, uh, uh, whether they're all vaccinated or va unvaccinated, the unvaccinated information is important so that we know what percentage of unvaccinated students have consented. That's the key part to this multi-layered approach. And I'm just, I am just not, not hearing it. Um, and I have quite frankly, greater concerns um, uh, with the lack of information and transparency that we have here today. And that's why we need to move in the direction of requiring this to be reported out. Uh, this is why you know we 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 need to get this information, and we will one way or the other. Um, I want to just move on quickly to the implementation of the mandate impact on on staffing in schools, and then I'll turn to my colleagues who've been very patient. Um, so the administration has said repeatedly that, uh, uh, and, and I want to say again for the record that I support. Uh, the vaccine mandates for our school communities. It, it does keep kids and staff safe. And I applaud, I wanna publicly applaud every member of our school community who did the right thing for their health, the health of their family, of their school and their community by getting vaccinated. Uh, I, I, I thank them for their, for, their, for their work and their service. And I also recognize the incredible work of the school leaders because the mayor made a comment on television, which really, uh, I think demoralized many school leaders when he said that those that had concerns about the implementation were a part of an ideology opposing the mandates. That is far from the truth. These principals leaders have been vaccinated from the beginning before the mandate, and they're working 24 seven to keep our kids safe and supported. So to all of our school leaders and our school teachers and our school support staff, everyone in the school community who have been working around the clock to support our kids, we see you, we hear you, we appreciate you. Um, and we respect you and we thank you. And words will never be enough for the work that you have put in on behalf of our children. I wanna say that, say that publicly. But Deputy Chancellor, I wanna, I wanna ask about uh, a certain disconnect that I keep hearing about on a daily basis. The mayor talks about having thousands of substitutes on call ready to go. Um, I am hearing daily about the lack of, of substitutes, power professionals, for example, in our school communities. Uh, do you have data with you on the number of paraprofessional positions that school communities have requested of Central to fill um, due to the implementation of the mandate? So that, thank you for that. Uh, I also want to join you in thanking all of our DOE uh, principals and all staff. As I've said earlier, we don't take for granted any of their contribution. In terms of the staffing for paraprofessionals, I will, uh, I'll turn to Lauren, but I will say to you that in the last uh, couple of days, I'm happy to even report that we've uh, uh, brought on board staff 800 paraprofessionals. And Lauren, you'll be able to speak more to this, please. Thank you. Um, and I absolutely agree. We are just incredibly grateful to our employees for their service and their dedication to our school communities. Um, I think, you know, for all of us who work in any piece of the education system, the reason we get up every day is for our kids and to support our students and families. And so it has just been so wonderful to see their, uh, their incredible efforts, especially over these past few weeks. And, you know, our, our numbers show that the overwhelming majority of staff, over 95% are vaccinated. To your question, Chair, about uh, paraprofessionals in particular. So there are, uh, our paraprofessionals right now are about 92% vaccinated. 
Um, and so that means there are about 1,700 who uh, did not meet the, the mandate deadline. To meet that need, we have deployed a whole range of tools to make sure that schools have what they need. And we are continuing, continuing to iterate each day and troubleshoot to make sure that each school has what they need. So on paraprofessionals, uh, particularly as Donald mentioned, um, we have a robust pool of vaccinated substitute paraprofessionals and we are continuing to grow that pool every day. We are now up to just about 5,800 uh, vaccinated substitute paraprofessionals available. Warren, Warren, yes. I, I say this respectfully and, and I thank you for your, also wanna publicly thank you for being always, whenever I have a question, you try to get us the answer right away. I appreciate this, but again, on this issue, um, there's a disconnect because I hear that there's these thousands or folks who are in this subcentral that are vaccinated, where are they? Uh, when principals I speak with in my district and other parts of the city who are short power professionals and they call central, they, they have not showed up to their schools. Additionally, these principals to their credit proactively found people who were qualified issued them nomination letters, sent it over to Central and are still waiting for them to get processed. So where are these thousands of subs when I hear principals tell me that they can't find any paraprofessionals right now? So uh, to your question about the nominations, and it's an important one, um, one of the, the big ways that we drive up this pool, that we increase the number of substitute paraprofessionals available is exactly by processing those nominations that schools do. And so we are expediting all of those nominations, which is why we saw that big increase in the number of sub paras available. Um, and it's uh, once we get the nomination, the application goes out to the paraprofessional to fill it out. They get fingerprinted. So it's not an immediate receipt of the letter and then all of a sudden they're cleared to work. It's important that they go through the same background check and vetting process that uh, all of our other staff do as well. But we are absolutely expediting those. Um, to make sure that we have that, that large pool available and that the substitute paraprofessionals that schools have direct relationships with are the first available so that they can uh, come to support the school. So Warren, and, and by the way, I, I hear everything you're saying and of course everyone has to pass you know, the, the, the proper checks. Um, it's just, it, it speaks to the fact that we needed to anticipate the fact that there was not gonna be 100% compliance across the board. We wanna get there, 100, I, I agree, but, and, and to give the public further context, we're talking about mandated service providers for students with IEPs, kids who absolutely are legally required to get certain services to meet their educational plans and goals. Uh, this is not, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is a critical position in a school community. Um, and uh, Warren, do you have data on the number of requests made to you, to your, to, to central, uh, on the number of requests for powers, for substitute powers um, across the city. Do you have that data with you? So the request for substitute powers, um, someone may be using a sub power for a whole range of reasons on a given day. Um, for example, it's obviously the vaccination mandate if they are short as a result of uh, an employee who was able to work prior to the mandate and now is not, uh, if someone is absent, but also just as a reminder all paraprofessionals start as substitutes, so it's a little bit different than teachers. So uh, the um, uh, some of the substitute paraprofessionals who are working are working in anticipation of ultimately converting to be full-time paraprofessionals. So what I do know is that we have thousands of substitute paraprofessionals working in our schools right now for all of those reasons, um, in order to make sure that that students' needs are met and that each. Uh, student has the services that are obviously mandated on their IEP with a qualified educator. And, and what I know is that there's a school in Southern Brooklyn that's still down 10 paraprofessionals and they're waiting for powers to get processed. There's a school in the Bronx I spoke with that is down about eight paraprofessionals and they're still waiting for powers to get processed. So, uh, which means that kids are not getting the services that they right, rightfully and are legally required to, to, to receive. So what, what I urge uh, the, the DOE to do is to do everything they can to expedite uh, safely these applications. And also, also um, those of you who may not know, I was a power for a brief period of time before becoming a teacher. 
And there are teacher applicants who have taken what's called the LEST, one of the, the first part of the exams to be a teacher, um, that automatically qualifies them to be a para. So if you're a, a teacher and waiting to be an educator, uh, waiting to take all your exams and finish all, your, uh, all the requirements, you can be a paraprofessional at that point, as long as you have a bachelor's degree and you pass the first part of, of, the, of the teaching exams. Um, so NYSID and the city can work together to kind of move to get these people into schools. Um, and I, so, so I think that there's a way, there, there should be planning to kind of get uh, folks who are credentialed, who are qualified, uh, to get them into the schools ASAP, because I think you would agree, Warren, that each day a kid's not getting service, services and supports, uh, they can't get that time back. Uh, so I think that that's a, that's a critical uh, critical thing. I have some more questions. I am Chair, mindful. Yeah, please. May I, yes, sorry, this, may, yes. may I just add this? We have a, an, an abundant number of substitute paraprofessionals. I'm willing and very happy to take those schools that you you've identified in the, in the South Bronx and in uh, your home district. We have a surplus number of, of paraprofessionals. We also have other supports that we can bring to bear in, in the situation in school of certified personnel to fulfill the responsibility that we have. So I don't want the uh, viewing public to think that we are just being negligent and uh, just ignoring the issue here. And I understand your sensitivity, and, uh, but I also want you to, to appreciate my position on this in that we are we are standing here today with uh, an excessive number of paraprofessional substitutes that we are ready to dispatch and deploy. I would love to know which of the schools and especially in District 21 or wherever the district is that so that we can uh, respond appropriately. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll share with you, uh, Deputy Chancellor, that uh, superintendents, not just in my district, but across the, the, the boroughs are aware of this dynamic. Um, and, and they also acknowledge that, and I, and I hear you today, uh, that there are uh, thousands of uh, folks that are in a portal uh, that claim to be available. The, the issue is that when they call central, when they call subcentral, the folks just don't show up. Um, and and that's, that's the issue. So you have people on a database, a number, they call and they're just not coming. But I, I'll be happy to speak to you further offline uh, okay. about, about these challenges. I, I wanna quickly just ask Commissioner Araka, who's been very patient, uh, and then I'll turn to my colleagues. I know that they've been very patient as well. Uh, Commissioner Araka, first of all, I wanna uh, you know, acknowledge and thank you for your service, who happens to be the, the buildings commissioner in, in the city of New York, uh, taking on major massive additional responsibility uh, for, for our, our school communities. Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, I, I'll ask you. I'll ask you this way: Why am I hearing from principals that they're on the phone with your staff, eleven o'clock at night, uh, to deal with contact tracing and ensuring that we're getting the right information out uh, to kid to to families about positive cases and other critical information about schools? Why are why are calls going deep into the night, 11 o'clock at night? Sure, thank you, Chair, for the, uh, for the entry to that uh, question. Uh, I, like my colleagues, uh, certainly appreciate the gravity of the situation we're in and what we're all striving to do. So uh, it is truly my pleasure to be here uh, and to play a role in keeping our students in their buildings uh, safely, as well as their staff uh, in those buildings as well. So with respect to the question, as you know, Chair, um, we strive to ensure that our principal and our school leaders are supported uh, and that we see to it that we move uh, the cases through and complete them uh, uh, on the same day that we're able to verify. And so our goal is to get to verification as quickly as possible and then ensure that school leaders have the information they need to move forward. And as we are now in our third week or so of school, we are constantly looking at our staffing levels and ensuring that we have folks positioned where we need them in order to um, uh, relieve uh, everyone's work as quickly as possible. So uh, we've made additional uh, uh, increases in our staffing to accommodate 
uh, the cases and the ebbs and flows of those to ensure we're able to provide principals and school leaders with the information they need as quickly as possible. And I, and I want to say this for the record, and, and I have, there's a lot to unpack there, but um, I know that there were some uh, folks that were asking or questioning about the Situation Room not working past 3.30 p.m. or a certain time. And there's an issue there about maybe the intake of new cases past 3.30 p.m., but the folks in the Situation Room are working past 3.30 p.m. I could confirm this because I get calls from and text messages from school leaders very late at night that they're on the phone with the Situation Room. The question is, however, Commissioner Rocca, is that at the previous hearing I had, the health commissioner testified that he would be uh, dedicating or the health department would be assigning health department staff to conduct this type of work, or they he would call them uh, whether disease detectives. Uh, and I and I and he didn't give us a number of how much staff he would dedicate to this. But what's happening now, just to kind of give the public a broader view. You have principals, assistant principals, teachers, others becoming de facto contact tracers, where they're on the phone with the situation room all hours of the day into the night, going over seating charts, who sat next to who, uh, did the, was the mask on for 15 minutes or more, and they have to call them the parents uh, to give them the update and to get them the right information. And that is very time consuming. And you know everything we're doing here is about getting kids educated and serviced and supported in school. That's taking time away from a principal, an AP, a teacher, support staff to support the kid. That should not fall on the responsibility of school staff. Where is the health department? So I, I wanna ask uh, Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Easterling, can, how much health department staff, and also Dr. Long, how much staff from your team are currently assigned full-time, not part-time, full-time to the DOE to keep our kids and staff safe? Do you have a number of staff? Well, I'll start uh, and then welcome Dr. Long to, to chime in as well. Uh, you know, as, as uh, Deputy Chancellor Conyers have already mentioned, this is very much a collective uh, process through our situation, situation room uh, with our colleagues at DOE, test and trace, uh, and many of our staff across um, across multiple agencies, including DOHMH, uh, there are well over 100 staff who are really involved in conducting case and school investigation, not just contact tracing, all of the you know work that you have already sort of laid out, uh, Chair Traeger, um, because we, we do want to make sure that we are supporting and making sure that we're getting the information. There are multiple sources of information. We don't just rely on teachers. We also rely on getting information from community as well in home to make sure that we are making um, an informed decision on what, what we understand how someone actually has become affected. So there are lots of hours and really commend all the, the staff that are in our situation room to really get this work done. But also, as you mentioned, all of the staff in the school as well who help provide this information, which is really important. So Dr. Eastling, if I hear you correctly, and, and, and again, I do want to say for the record, I appreciate all the city workers working hard to keep kids and staff safe. I, I, I want to say that. The question is, is, is it enough? I don't think it is. Um, it, it, just if you said again, it's, it's 100 health department staffers that are assigned to schools full time. Is that correct? The, the number is over, over 100, um, not just uh, health department, uh, again, including uh, our, our test and trace colleagues, some of the contact tracers. Uh, we have clinical staff, epidemiologists, data experts. So there are multiple varied roles that, are, that go in to make sure. Go ahead. So are, are you comfortable then knowing that, and tell me how, you know, as a public health official, uh, I just shared with Commissioner Waraka and, and the public that Basically, principals, APs, teachers, support staff are the ones communicating mainly with families about what happened in the school, who is a close contact, who is not, and so forth. Parents inevitably have a lot of questions about that. Teachers, principals are not public health experts. They're not health officials. They're, they're, they're asked very specific health-related questions, um, and they want to make sure that they get it right. But... Number one, they're being pulled from instruction, which is their main job is to educate our kids. 
But number two, they're not health experts. They're not licensed in this field. And they're being tasked with answering very important questions that families come up during these, during these contacts. So um, have you heard and how do you feel about hearing that teachers, administrators are the ones really dealing with families on these health related questions and not really health officials that actually know this work at, at a very granular important level. Chair, yeah. okay. I apologize, Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, would love to bring in Dr. Ted Long as well into the conversation, yeah. because I do think it's important to speak about the, as you're um, raising chair, the notion of tracing and how that folds in as well. Um, and importantly, into the activities that the Department of Health is doing with respect to not only the Situation Room, but more broadly. And, and I do want to just make sure we're acknowledging those two very important roles here. Um, so if you don't mind, Chair, I'd like to just bring in Dr. Long uh, to add on to, uh, to Dr. Easterling's remarks. Sure. Yeah, and well, Chair, if Mrs. Ted, if I may start by saying I really appreciate your question. I am a father of two uh, children myself, and um, I can't claim to have the same claim to fame as your, uh, with your eight years of uh, being an educator yourself of uh, world history and government in high school. Uh, but I am an in-person teacher now at NYU, so I think a lot about with myself being a teacher, where I go every week to teach in-person class, what that means for me and what I would want to know ahead of time and from the perspective of my students as well. So um, one of the distinctions that's important, let me first by being very directly answering your question, and then I want to talk about the roles of tracers versus uh, uh, principals and teachers. So Test and Trace has dedicated 200 uh, disease detectives, if you will, to the situation room. That's double what we'd had for similar case levels in the previous year. So we're, um, from our perspective, adequately staffed. And the, but there is a reason why, um, please. Because last year, under a third of the kids were in the building. Now everyone's back, is that correct? Um, well, so that, that's, I, I'm giving you the number of tracers sort of per case, so that the case number, whether there's more or less kids in the building, if it's, you know, 200 cases, that's 200 infected people, so there's 200 contact tracing instances that we would do there. But um, let me just, let me just chime in for a second. Yes, Chair, we do, and in anticipation of this school year, we most certainly uh, were keenly aware that we would see changes in our in-person uh, uh, total population numbers. So uh, undoubtedly, that was a uh, factor in our preparation for this school year in terms of staffing levels. And again, as I mentioned, during the initial um, uh, first few days of the school year, we were keenly monitoring the number of uh, staff we had, certainly, uh, the number of cases we saw, and what we felt was the um, productivity level, for lack of a more articulate way, of, of seeing how, how our um, uh, cases were moving along. And that was a moment where we looked back and saw, you know, did we, do we think we had enough wiggle room? We believe, and we still uh, uh, believe we are sufficiently staffed, as, as Dr. Long has mentioned. But the notion of giving us more breathing room was something we were paying very close attention to, which is why we did uh, move to very quickly bring on additional staff uh, to allow us that, that flexibility. So Dr. Long, I apologize. No, no, I was, uh, I was gonna go into the, the, the contact tracing versus um, what the roles of principals and teachers are and everything like that. But Chair Traeger, did you wanna ask any other follow-ups uh, for what we just said, or is it okay for me to go into? No, you could, you could finish uh, what you answered, and then I have a quick follow-up, and then I'll turn to yeah. my colleagues, please. Of course. So, uh, again, uh, coming at this from the perspective of myself being a teacher and a parent, um, you know, what the, one of the main problems we want to solve is if um, a family has a, one of their children that has had an exposure, meaning they should quarantine, we want them to know that the same day that we know that. Um, so the one of the, you know, the reason uh, we end up staying late in situation room, um, and Commissioner Loraka can share more about this, is if we get a case that comes in later in the day, you're right, contact tracing is hard, but we stay late because we want to make sure that we're able to have that communication to the families. 
The communication from principals to the families, these are pre-written letters that we work together to make sure that we're not putting principals on the spot in place of being public health experts. But I do want to um, emphasize actually something that you said, um, I think sort of jokingly, but I think it's actually a really important point um, where you said um, they're doing contact tracing themselves. Yeah, they are. I'm proud of that. You know, I, I think across our city, the way contact tracing works is these are New Yorkers that uh, have uh, risen up from our most affected communities and work with people to help them to identify who they might have exposed oh, when they were infectious. Well, Dr. Wong, and I, I say this with the utmost respect, if they've if they're becoming de, uh, if they're becoming de facto contact tracers, maybe I missed. The, was there a PD for them, deputy transfer, to become contact tracers? Was there a workshop that I might have missed? Because no, I don't hear. So let me just jump in and say this as a 13 year principal um, and, and understanding the mindset and the psych, the psych, psyche of a principal, yeah. they didn't, there was no workshop, there was no uh, training, but what we have are established routines in classrooms that teachers have. So the teachers, the principal is not running around every classroom trying to collect that data herself or themselves the information that we're asking principals and we appreciate them gathering this information because this is a local situation, right? And they are the, the stewards in that building. They have set structures and systems in place to ensure that A, the teacher knows, and you may remember the Delaney book from high school. Um, oh, I do. Yeah. Right, so teachers know who's sitting where, who should be in the particular seats who was in school that day, the routine that they've established from day one vis-a-vis -vis the reasons why we keep our mask on, the reason why we walk at a certain distance. So principals then tap into that information to isolate the, uh, to get the members' names, the students' names that were part of uh, the situation that we're examining. So I, there was no training uh, chair, just to be, but we're also, I also have to say that we're doing this together. Why? Because we want students in school. We want, we want to keep schools open. So I know there are going to be some principals that uh, may voice some concerns about it. And we are taking steps and have been taking steps to try to ensure that we do the very best to minimize the number of minutes, hours that principals have to spend doing a very important thing with the situation room. But you yeah, see, what I and Dr. Wong, but, but there are technical questions here because that, yeah. for example, if I was still teaching and I had to answer parents' questions and calls and a parent looks up the CDC guidance and says, well, was my child safely social distancing the entire day? Looking at the picture I saw earlier, I would say no. I would not, I would not lie to the parent. Number two, during lunch, and I, now I say this from my own experience because I visited mm -hmm. schools in my district and beyond during lunch, during lunch, social distancing is not happening uh, in many schools, in many schools. I can't say for every school, in many schools, it's not happening. It's hard. And, and I think it's okay for the city to acknowledge it's a challenge, but let's not kind of tell the public all, all is great when in fact, it's impossible in many cases to, to safely physical distance. So if a parent yeah. asks me, did my child uh, maintain safe distance throughout the day? I will be honest with the parents and say in many cases, no. And, and I, don't, I am not a health expert to then elaborate on what that means, Dr. Wong. That's my- Oh no, point. totally. And I didn't mean to say that their yeah. DOE student, or staff would replace contact tracers. They're, they're, we, our contact tracers are seasoned um, uh, you know, public health experts that specialize in all of these rules and how to do all of this. But we're reliant on working with principals and teachers for the information, as you said, about what actually happens in the classroom. We aren't physically in the classroom. We know cold all of the rules that I've talked to you about today about how CD, the CDC guidance um, and how all of these decisions need to be made. And we walk the principals and the teachers through all of this, but we rely on the information that they have. So use your scenario. If you're a teacher in a classroom and you can't confirm for me if I'm the contact tracer talking to you that these two students were always three feet apart, always wearing a mask, then the student that's next to the case would become a close contact. We, and so, and that's up to the teacher to be able to make that confirmation. And if they can't, then we, in those no scenarios, we would make those, those students would be close contacts for the very simple reason that we're applying the CDC's evidence-based criteria. And that requires confirmation of whether the student next to another case is three feet apart and is wearing a mask. But the, the final point I'll make, if I may, and I'll turn back to you, is what we ask, what, the way we work with principals 
going to your example of into the evening, is we have pre-written letters and we need to make that decision about who's going to get which the letter saying um, that one of your children, like one of my children, should stay home the following day, because that's what parents want to know, or um, whether there was a, a case in a school, but your student is not one of the people um, that's been identified as a close contact. So we don't put the principals on the spot to have in, you know, conversations about public health or anything. That's why we work with them to actually have these letters pre-written. But what we do here is we provide all of the expertise and, act, and do the guidance and do the actual contact tracing reliant on um, the expertise or the, um, the knowledge about what happens on the ground that you just shared great examples of. So everything you just said would be how we would work with you as a teacher. And if we can confirm that you meet CDC guidance, then we act accordingly. If not, then that's the other, then that's the direction we go in. Dr. Long, final uh, question. Do you, and I asked this of Dr. Commissioner Choksi, he, well, I wanna hear your thoughts and Dr. Easterling and Deputy Commissioner. Um, should New York City uh, require vaccination for students in our, in our school system? Uh, from your public health hat, from, from my public health hat, should we require a vaccination for students? So I'll start and I'm happy to turn to Dr. Easterman and I, I'm also going to tap in um, our, DOD, our DOE colleagues here. Um, so vaccination is the most important tool that we have to fight COVID. Nothing is more important than uh, getting COVID out of New York City and keeping our students safe and giving them an in-person education the whole way through. Anything that we can do to facilitate more of our students getting vaccinated, it's a ladder. The ladder starts with being able to make the vaccine available and acceptable. Talking to doctors like myself, I talk to my patients every Friday when I'm in clinic in the Bronx. And if, when you get to a point in the Dr. ladder, Long, where, I'm quick, getting quick, I'm quick, 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 quick question. Yeah. You said that you're, you're, a, you're a professor, is that correct? Yes. Does your college require vaccination for your students? It does. I'm a professor why, why, you. Why, why do you think your college requires that? So um, I, I don't want to speak for NYU, but the, the way I, I think about mandates to directly answer your question is it's the end of the ladder. You do everything you can. The, the goal we all share, and as you said yourself, um, you, know, you understand the importance of the vaccine in terms of really fighting off COVID so that we can do the most important thing that you as a teacher believe, and I couldn't agree more, giving our students a good education. I want nothing more. That's what I want for my two children. I feel very strongly about that. Um, but in terms of the, the um, mandated and vaccine for students, that's a decision we would make when we feel, um, and this is you know when, when DOE feels, that we're at the point in the ladder where we can't go any further and we've exhausted all the other options we have, including the fact that we've been at every single school, every single uh, high school, uh, as you know, in the first week of school with our mobile vaccine units, that's bringing access. We're still offering to bring a vaccine to your home and we're giving you hundred dollars if it's your first dose of it. That's access with an incentive. So we're doing everything that we can. I care nothing more about uh, you know, bringing safety to our city through the vaccine, but it's a ladder. And when we get to the point where DOE feels like we've hit that wall, that's where the discussion of a uh, student uh, vaccine mandate would come about. Dr. Easton, I don't want to add to that. But Dr. Long, is it, is it correct to say that NYU required vaccination prior to the start of the semester? Yes, that is correct to say. So they started at the beginning of the ladder, is that right? Um, I, I, yeah, they, well, no, no, no. Uh, so NYU had, um, if you look back to last year, other policies in place um, to you know, promote vaccination and to make sure that they had other safety protocols too. I don't want to understate NYU, what NYU did, but you are correct in what you said, that before I started teaching, they had a mandate for teachers like myself and for students. And I will say to agree with you further, I feel comfortable as a teacher knowing that everybody I'm around is vaccinated. It actually makes me right. feel very comfortable that I'm able to teach to the best of my ability. I'm not as good right. a teacher as you, but no, no, no. You are you you are a seasoned educator, and and I appreciate your your public service, Dr. Long. But I think you've hit on the key points uh, uh, on the importance of, of of vaccination. But I'll say we haven't even heard today from the administration how many kids in our school system are vaccinated. Um, vaccines are safe and effective, um, and I, I do think this is a this is a critical part. And we need to hear from our public health experts without any political interference. We need to hear directly from our public health experts what we should be doing as a system. And, and, and that's why I would just really appreciate someone's honest, sincere opinion as a public health expert, whether or not we should be requiring. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Long, but in colleges, the consequence if students do not get vaccinated, in my, I've heard anecdotally that they be shifted to remote instruction. They can't come in person classes. Is that correct? 
Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not the expert to answer that. I could tell you in my right. class where I teach, it's in person only. So we don't have a remote option for my class. Uh, if you don't, right. so. Right. At last year in our school, in our school system, it was everyone had to get tested. Otherwise, you, you shifted to remote. Now we have no remote option, even though we definitely need one for our families. But let me now turn to my colleagues who have been very, very patient and I have some additional, additional questions. Uh, I will now turn in the order that I have. Uh, council member, uh, sorry, Malcolm, if you want to just call the next council member. Uh, Aaliyah, forgive me. Hi, Chair. Hello, this is Aaliyah, policy analyst to the Committee on Education. I'm just filling in for Malcolm Budahorn. He'll be returning shortly. Our first council member for questions is council member Dinowitz. Your time will be. Thanks very much. Um, first, thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, thanks to everyone who's gotten vaccinated. And you know, thank you to our educators, including school aides, paraprofessionals, food service, um, uh, assistants, custodian, teachers, related service providers, administrators, parents, for what you do every day. Um, I just want to say I hope we in the council are not just saying thank you, but demonstrating our thanks by, by what we're doing today and every day. And thank you to the panelists for coming. I, I, I want to pick up on the on um, Chair Traeger's comments or a question about the vaccination mandate. Um, one of the, the problems we've seen is not that there's a vaccination mandate. I think that's great. Thumbs up. It's that it happens after the school year begins. Kids are, and faculty are already flooding into the hallways as it's being litigated in court. What plans are being made now to, to uh, mandate a vaccine for students? Or what plans are being made now if the state, let's say, requires students be vaccinated? What plans are you making now to communicate with the families and what contingency plans are being made knowing that you're going to be struggling with, with resistance to use, uh, uh, to use uh, the first deputy chancellor's words, resistance um, and absences? So I'll jump in and, and, uh, po and uh, point to Dr. Easterling, but I will say to you that we are constantly always thinking about, we, it's not last minute, Charlie, we're thinking, trying to think ahead to put things in place so that we are responding to a need, anticipating, and we're doing it jointly. It's not just the DOE, we are relying heavily on our health professionals to ensure that we are moving in lockstep. But I, I would ask Dr. Easterling to, uh, to comment further? Yep, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, First Deputy Chancellor. Uh, you know, just, just to the vaccine mandate and just to pick up on uh, some of the points uh, that Dr. Long had mentioned, um, we're always thinking about the process to climb the ladder. And so we first started with adults because we knew that transmission, not only in schools, but in our community was really driven by adult transmission. And so when we talk about vaccine mandates, it was really about making sure that we can stop the spread and where we saw the greatest transmission. And I think that we are making really great strides in ensuring uh, that we're really getting higher vaccine rates for our adults. And Chair Traeger, you mentioned this. You know, it wasn't the first day of school when majority of teachers, majority of principals and staff were vaccinated. We had hundreds of sites across the city uh, where adults were already getting vaccinated. Majority of teachers were already vaccinated. And then on the first day of school, we had uh, buses, mobile vans available. And so it wasn't, the, you know, so yes, I, I, get, I mean, so I don't mean to interrupt. I just, I just want to, let me ask it differently uh, okay. because time is limited. Are you considering requiring students to be met to, to be vaccinated? Are you considering that requirement? So yes, we're, we're, yeah, we're looking at the data and we are considering uh, additional ways in which we can climb the ladder to require vaccines. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is the, the same problems we're having now, this is the same problems a lot of us articulated on September 1st and talked about last year, that it's not necessarily the decisions that are being made. Again, I think a vaccine mandate is good, literally saving lives. Parents trust that their kids are gonna be more safe in the classrooms with it. The problem is when it happens last minute. So at what point do you share or do you communicate to us in the council, to parents, to families, to everyone in the city, what that thinking of, you keep saying thinking about, what does that look like? What does that sound like? At what point are those ideas 
and those plans being communicated so that families have time to adapt and that teachers and all the faculty members and principals have time to adapt and, and implement these plans. Yeah, I, well, I'll just say, you know, we already have existing uh, requirements in place, as you know, for high risk sports, and we've communicated clearly how uh, we want to ensure that those athletes are vaccinated. We're going to have additional announcements related to expanding the age to five to 11. So that's going to be, we have to be able to be sure to be clear about communicating those vaccine eligibility to those parents as well. And then, yes, you know, as we make decisions and policies around requiring vaccines, any additional steps, we will be lockstep in making sure that that information gets out to parents as well. But I get, okay, running out of time, I, I, I wanna make clear that the timeline for a lot of these decisions has been extremely troubling. Families need time to make decisions, not just getting the vaccine, teachers need time. There are going to be- Time is expired. There are going to be problems once the vaccine mandate for children, for students is implemented. And I urge you to share information and plans long in advance, right? The, the, even before the vaccine is approved for our younger children, what that plan looks like. So, so, so you and Department of Buildings and the Health Department and our schools and teachers can, you know, can prepare for this. Um, Chair, if I just may ask a few more questions. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back to, you know, a lot of the issues with substitutes has been uh, addressed. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, you say you have enough substitutes, right? I just want to be clear. You say you have enough substitutes for every vacancy. Um, how many substitutes, how many vacancies rather are there right now that require substitutes? How many vacancies are there? Lauren, do you want to point to that, please? Thank you, uh, and thank you for the question. So um, in terms of the number of staff that we're talking about, um, uh, as Donald mentioned earlier, the, the vast, vast majority of our staff are vaccinated. So there are um, uh, just over 7,000 DOE employees who uh, did not receive the vaccine or we don't have a record that they have received the vaccine. Okay. Um, some of those staff are of course um, uh, on other leaves but um, that's the, the universe that we're talking about. Got it. Um, yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's it, it, sure, it sure. Is not out of disrespect to you, it's out of respect for the time. So, sure. So those, let's say those 7,000 positions are filled. How many of those 7,000 positions on a typical day are being filled by substitutes which are teaching out of license, right? How many, in other words, how many people um, certified for elementary school are being sent to a high school? To fill so that the, the the seven thousand number that is all DOE staff not vaccinated that includes all of our titles that's not just teachers um, of that you know uh, three thousand or or fewer are are teachers um, but uh, so that's why I'm just it's it's hard to to answer your question the one thing I do want to say is that the way that uh, any gaps are filled is not exclusively substitutes. Uh, schools are able to have existing certified teachers cover additional classes, teach additional periods, um, uh, and use other tools uh, with existing staff as well, uh, as well as hire long-term leave replacements uh, in order to meet that need. So I didn't want you to think that substitutes was the only tool that we had to support what schools need. No, I know, and, and that includes central staff, which I'll get to in a second. Mm -hmm. But again, how many of, on a, you know, outside of emergency coverage, which is not, how many of these substitutes are teaching out of license? Let's say long-term subs. Let's just let's just leave it there. How many of the long-term subs that are hired or are being sent out are teaching students in an area where they're not trained and were never uh, expected to teach? So right now, again, since the, the mandate um, was just implemented, the what schools would be pulling from in terms of day-to-day -day subs, they wouldn't yet be at you know, they wouldn't yet be a long-term sub, right? So it's- So there, is it fair to say, mo okay, okay. Is it fair to say most of the teachers now covering classes are probably not licensed to teach that class? Is, it, is that fair to say? 
the vast majority of our teachers and our staff are vaccinated. So we're talking about, you know, a temporary situation where schools are adjusting to the data as it's changing every day, since we're still seeing hundreds of new, of hundreds of staff upload proof of vaccination. So that uh, I, I know I, I'm sensing that I'm not uh, giving you the information that you're looking for, but it's it's yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm it's hard to, to answer given the. I know I understand all of the variables. I guess what I'm getting at is, is that there are a lot of classrooms with teachers in them who are not licensed to teach that uh, material and never went to school for it, never did PD in it. And now our children are in classes without um, teachers certified, not just for that subject, but maybe for that, even that age range. It, it goes back to the planning, which is why it's so important that when you have a student mandate for vaccines, we know about it far in advance. So, so you don't have uh, necessarily a number of teachers teaching out of license right now and these substitute, uh, the substitute teachers teaching out of license right now. That's not information that you have. No, and, and what I will say though, is that obviously our priority is to make sure that we have excellent educators in front of our students in safe schools. That is the priority that we are driving towards every single day. And um, in creating our sub pool, we pull from uh, a robust uh, pool of, of substitute teachers who have worked with DOE before. Many of them are certified teachers um, and we are continuing to grow that pool. But our priority like yours is to make sure that we are putting excellent qualified educators in front of our students every day inside safe schools. And you also pull from central staff, is that correct? Yes, we did redeploy uh, central staff to, to support schools. And, and what impact has that had on your ability to function, central staff's ability to function and provide other support for teachers, including tech support, including support for students with IEPs, CSIS, especially now, Google Classroom and Zoom? So as I said earlier, for all of us at DOE, no matter what office you sit in, our priority is to serve students every day. No, I and get, so, I get that. I, I don't, I don't doubt your, you know, the DOE's intent and mm -hmm. commitment to safety and education. I, I'm not questioning that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm questioning the impact that, again, it's these really these these last minute uh, decisions are having on our children. Mm -hmm. And so, in this case, my my question is the impact of pulling central staff, which seems like you need to do because they're aren't enough substitutes, pulling central staff and putting them as substitutes in school, which, okay. which again are probably out of license, but what impact that's having on your, the ability for everyday teachers who have gotten vaccinated, those 95% of teachers, to get the support they need regarding, again, CSIS, Google Classroom, Zoom, you know, anything else they need from central. So if I may jump in, uh, council yes. member. So uh, what the the picture, the portrait that you are uh, painting is one of the, the like sheer devastation. We have not left ourselves bare where we don't have the essential functions that we need to, for those, uh, as you talked about Zoom and the tech, digital technology ceases. We are still functioning. We understand the underpinning of what happens in schools. What Lauren is speaking about is the most important lo location is what happens in schools and we support that we don't we don't have everyone uh, out in the in the uh, schools leaving us with zero we still have support staff that are dealing with all the functions that we need to deal with we have uh, professionals that have come out of central to go add to so remember we have substitutes the number of substitutes far exceeds the number of unvaccinated teachers. So I want to remember, I will remind us of that. And when we go into schools, for those substitutes that you feel may be out of license, I was in a, in a middle school two days ago, 2,100 uh, students in the middle school, principal dedicated, was working with the subs, the five subs that came in, 
having joint planning sessions with the teachers that were there. 95% of our teachers are in. So we are enveloping these substitute teachers with the support. Many of them are long-term subs from the past. Many of the central workers are working within their license and their discipline area. So I, you know, and forgive me if I sound, uh, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful in my tone, but this is, I don't want a picture of devastation to be the picture that we are left with here. We have been planning for this. What we cannot control is when you're going to take that that shot your vaccination we're working to get everyone there but what we are controlling for is making sure we have quality service provision where there are gaps that are, that exist so you don't have to apologize for a tone right we all care about our kids our careers what we what we yes. do every day and, 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 and council member just just support. to make uh, just to let you know uh, this will be the final question because some other members have okay. to go to other other but please yeah, ask ask Absolutely. Okay, so I'll so so no need to apologize. You know, we all care. I, I just um, again going back to planning. Are you planning more robust? I mean, it's pretty clear based on Councilmember Traeger's questions and the responses that the the testing capacity is not as robust as it needs to be. Um, but are you planning for more robust testing? Um, after Thanksgiving, after the Christmas, New Year's break, after President's Week, after Passover? Are you planning now? Because people go away, people see, people gather. What plans are you making now to up the staff to, to, to make sure that those that, that, that you're really going in there and testing like every kid? Because people go away, people interact with people outside there, you know, we're still doing pods and, and all that. Well, there's certain things that I, and, and we even need the assistance of other external allies like yourself. We need parents to have their students uh, tested. So they must consent to testing. We know about Thanksgiving and things sorry, are going they, away. They don't, but, but I'm sorry to interrupt because Tom and I want to respect everyone else. I'm sorry. They, they don't have to consent to testing, right? So like- This is correct. Right, so, but even with the 192,705 consent forms, they're not all being tested. Are, are you planning on tested at least all of those kids after those holidays. And, and, so I, will I, just, and I will just leave you with, with I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but I'm going to bet that most of your consent forms are not from the Bronx, not from where, not from my area. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet that the most robust testing is not done in the Bronx where you have the highest rates of COVID. Um, and so when you talk about, you know, going in, reaching out to parents, come to the Bronx. Uh, because what Chair Traeger said is true. There is a there is a big disconnect between your data, your Excel spreadsheets, the, the, what you are doing, and what's actually happening on the ground, and the impact it has on our children, and especially on on my students um, here in the Bronx. And I would urge you to start planning now for robust testing of every child after those breaks. And, Doctor, and I'll leave it there. Good. Well, I would I would well, and, love for Doctor Long uh, to to uh, respond. Please. And he's muted. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, well, first off, just uh, to um, talk about the Bronx for a moment, that happens to be where I am a primary care doctor at Morrison Community Health Center in the Bronx. So I hear from my patients all the time who have children that are in our school, what some of their concerns are, what some of the um, uh, of their perceptions of how things are going are. And I, you know, what I hear from my patients most often is they want their kids to be in school, but they want to make sure their kids are safe in school, which, which we all get. And you, that's exactly what you were saying. Um, so to go rewind for a moment, I'll make two points here about testing. First is where we started and how we've changed over time. And second is, did it work? What do we know about what happened? Um, so going back, I'm going to take you back to September of 2020. So, you know, year over a year ago now. Um, at that time, when we were, uh, we became the first big city in the country to reopen our schools. And I, I, we all, I, I really believe, should be so proud that we were able to do that, um, where other big cities were not able to, to offer any in-person learning at the beginning of the school year last year. Um, at that point, we were doing a random sample of tests. We developed this method um, that now the CDC, um, you know, recommends their main recommendation. Now other, other places have followed. And we were doing monthly testing at that point of schools. Then over time, as we saw uh, the percent positivity in New York City and different communities change, we adapted. We did as much as uh, you know, weekly testing 
um, at schools in New York City, which we're able to change over time, guided to use Dr. Easterling's words, guided by the evidence. So the testing that we're doing now, a random sample, which is the strategy we've used before on a weekly basis, is the same as the higher frequency of testing, four times more frequent uh, than, than when we started last year. And then did it work? I think this is a really important question. This is why I tell my patients. Um, you know, if, if you look at the, um, the, num the cases and the transmission um, in New York City, uh, you know, for the first half of the school year last year, which includes, you know, part of our second wave, uh, which was um, in New York City. Uh, if you were a student or a teacher and you were at home in remote learning, you had the same, if not greater risk of getting COVID than if you were a student or teacher in person in school last year in DOE. And that right there is, for me, such a compelling fact that that's where our layers of protection with our testing strategy changing over time the result of all of that is actually our, our schools were one of the safest places to be, making it less likely for you to get COVID than if you were at home. And you, I think you're, you know as well as I do what some of the potential reasons there are, but I'll finish by saying, I agree with you. As things change in the future, we may, uh, there are a variety of indications that would make us want to think about doing testing in uh, more frequent, different ways. You know, we're guided by the evidence. We're very quick to adapt. Um, as Chair Traeger pointed out in the beginning, we went from bi-weekly testing to weekly testing in the snap of a finger. We, we, can, um, we, we have a very strong testing infrastructure here, and we just want titrate testing following CDC guidance, but knowing that if we have to change and moving forward in the future, we have the, we've built our, arguably the strongest uh, infrastructure in the country, um, and we can make that change throughout the year last year, and it really did work making our schools arguably safer than being at home. Well, I, I thank you all for your time. I, I urge all of you, if, you, if you're, you know, Traeger, Chair Traeger mentioned this, I mentioned this last time, is uh, at September 1st hearing, to build that trust, and you, and you do that by honest communication, and, and one of the ways is, as I urge everyone who's working very hard for our children and our professionals throughout the city, is tell us the plans. If you're, if you're going to require a negative PCR test before we come back from breaks, which you should, let the parents know, let the families know, let everyone know. If there's gonna be a vaccine mandate, let everyone know so we can all plan for it. Uh, and I'll leave it with there. Thank you everyone. Thank you for the uh, extra time. Yes, and it's gonna be, I, I, I ask my colleagues to be mindful of the time because the certain folks in the administration may have to hop on to health meetings at some point. So please, let's just, uh, I know this is a very important, urgent hearing, and I, everyone has very critical questions. So please, uh, Aliyah, please call on the next council member. Uh, actually, council member, it's Malcolm, I'm back. Um, thank you, Aliyah, for taking over. Uh, just before we go to council member Barron, for the record, we just want to recognize that council members Gennaro, Rodriguez, Miller, Feliz, Salamanca, and Levin have joined us. So next we'll turn to council member Barron, followed by council member Miller, followed by council member Levin, council member Barron. Uh, thank you very much. And I will be mindful of the time because I know that there are lots of people with lots of questions. I wanna make sure everyone can get their questions in. I wanna thank the chair uh, for calling this very important topic, very timely and one that really needs to be addressed. But before I get delving into uh, topic of the day, I do want to acknowledge and, and celebrate the opening of the brand new East New York Family Academy, which is a middle school, high school, which has been in my district for years and was previously housed in 12 portables. They now have a brand new five-story beautiful building. Uh, they have the up-to-date HVAC system. They have a gymatorium. They have not bleacher seats, but they have individual seats, not benches in the gymnasium. They've got a dance studio with the floating floor and the mirrors. They've got a beautiful cafeteria with two walk-in freezers. We have a principal's office, of course, the custodian suite. We have the nurse's suite. We have the guidance suite. We've got two fully equipped science labs with the emergency uh, isolation, no, the emergency decontamin decontamination system if needed. Uh, we've got a library, of course. We've got a music studio with five adjoining practice rooms. And we have an arts and crafts room with a separate area for firing the kill of the projects that the students create. And I'm forgetting something. Oh, the swimming pool. 
we have a swimming pool. So it's a brand new building. And of course, we are excited that we're in a new school year, even though we're still battling with this uh, monster COVID that we're facing. To move to the topic, um, to, to the deputy chancellor, the chair asks about the number of students enrolled. And you made ref you said you didn't have that information and you made reference to October 31st. I certainly hope that you're not expecting us to wait until October 31st for the DOE to tell us how many children are enrolled in our city schools. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, it's good to see you again. Uh, I, certainly, I certainly expect that when the, the uh, enrollment office is finished with their, whatever the tabulation is, uh, whether it be pre October 31st or on October 31st, they will convey that. I am not going to sit here certainly and uh, fabricate something in front of you that you'll have it without me being certain of that. It, it will be our attempt to make sure you get that data as early as is possible. I understand, of course, you know, we were both principals. I understand that uh, the number fluctuates, the number varies, but I know I had to report daily what my enrollment numbers were, as well as my attendance number. So is that no longer the case, which means you then can't compile what it is that individual schools have at, uh, in their buildings? Now, there are other situations. There are rosters or registers that need to be cleaned. There, right. right. So th th that's all the process. So I, I really cannot give a number. And I know that a principal on a daily basis is working with their teams to ensure that they have. Uh, right. So so to that end, um, we don't have a number today and principals in their schools may have an approximate number, but it is not an absolute final number. I know. All right. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Okay. I'm going to move on. My time is already down to a minute. Um, we, we have parents who don't want to, and staff members who are reluctant or hesitant about the vaccine. And we know that these are people, children, students 12 and up, and staff members who of course have been vaccinated because they wouldn't be working in schools had they not been vaccinated with whatever the required vaccination standards are. So the reluctance and the hesitancy, I think we need to acknowledge is in part based on the fact that this is a new vaccine. And I'm not talking about a nine month vaccine. I understand that for 15 years previously, there's been work that has been done and that this nine month period was when it ramped up. I understand that. But there is a legitimate, I think, hesitancy or reluctance for those who don't get the vaccine. And as much as we haven't had an 18 month, a two year or three year period since the vaccine was approved to see what other effects might come. So I, I wanna speak for those who are reluctant or hesitant to say, yes, I understand that because there's not uh, a longevity, there's not a period of saying, listen, it's been two expired. years, three years, four years. Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I could just finish this up. And so we wanna acknowledge that. And, and in that regard, there are parents who have, uh, have expressed a concern that they should be able to continue to be able to have that remote learning opportunity. And I do want to acknowledge that Chance Supporter was gracious enough to have a meeting to address those concerns of those parents who said, listen, I have uh, elderly parents at home, I have health compromised situations at home, and I don't want my child going to an environment where they might be able to catch this virus and bring it home. I want to continue the remote option. I wanna have a hybrid option. And, and the case comes to mind that at some point, there may be, as my colleagues have talked about, an uptick, a surge, and how quickly are we going to be able to go back to what we had before, which is the hybrid mode model or the remote model, so that that technology, which many people were forced to learn to use, can in fact, again, be implemented so that we can have the continuous uh, education of our children. So what are the plans for what the signals, what is the platform 
what are the plans, what's the um, threshold at which we can say, listen, this is a surge here, our positivity rate is beyond what it should be, and we may need to go to remote. Do we have those criteria in place? So th that is a comprehensive question with lots of un, uh, appealing back, some, some of it to the uh, health professionals. But I can assure you from the educative side of this that we have already taken the steps, learning lessons from uh, where we've come from about how to uh, turn to remote uh, instruction as necessary due to a closure. We, to date, have had one closure, one school closure. We've yes. minimized that, thankfully. And... Uh, we have been working with both executive superintendents, superintendents and principals for a state of readiness that, that spreads the gamut of from your devices to your um, instructional material to the emergency contact numbers of staff to uh, ensuring that they understand how to upload. There was a provision of time made uh, given for teachers to upload uh, information, digital information. So we have, we're not waiting to uh, Council Member Dinowitz's um, uh, earlier point. We have not been uh, stagnant there. We've been understanding where we've come from, anticipating where we may reluctantly or of necessity have to go because of uh, an outbreak. We have put in place all of the measures that allow principals now to understand all the different things they need to look at. We are very careful uh, and in a forensic way about looking at our new principals. And I know you understand a new principal versus a more senior principal. We're enveloping them with the information, the support, the guidance to ensure that they understand what to do if they have to uh, uh, go to a remote uh, instruction option. We are, we are already doing, we've started that. We continue okay. to work in, on that. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, if I could have one last question. And that question is, uh, posed to Dr. Easterling and his staff. What is the assessment of natural antibodies for those who have recovered and who have antibodies? And why isn't that considered in this um, demand that everybody be vaccinated when there are people who have natural antibodies? Thank you. A uh, very good question. And, and thank you uh, for that question. Um, but one, I just want to just quickly say uh, that I thank you for acknowledging, you know, certainly the hesitancy and the skepticism. I also joined, uh, you know, that talk as well. And I thank you uh, for you and the Simply Baron for, for hosting us uh, to, to talk about it. Um, second, um, we, you know, that there, there is a challenge in really trying to quantify uh, natural infection. We do have ways to really show uh, that um, we know that vaccinated induced antibodies are really helping to push back on the spread of disease. We have done uh, some studies to understand uh, what um, natural um, uh, protection is present in the, in the community, but I think it's going to take uh, more steps for us to do that. Ways in which we have already done it is really doing an antibody uh, or a serial survey to really understand where, um, who has previous infection and I think that as we understand more about the presence of antibodies due to vaccines versus natural antibodies, I think we'll be able to get to a better place to report out. But we're certainly not there yet to be able to say that with clarity. Thank you very much. Thank you to the chair and thank you to the panel for coming and uh, sharing with us. Thank you, Council Member Barron. And, and I would just want to just add, uh, thank you, Council Member Barron, uh, for your expertise, both as a council member and as an educator. You always operate under that lens. And I really appreciate you and, and other teachers that we have here in the council. You're a principal, as a matter of fact. Um, but when we hear about Councilman Barron about the need that we might have to, uh, if there's a surge in cases, we might need to, to shift to remote. I would argue that we already have concerning uh, reports out there, meaning that I have heard just anecdotally because we don't we haven't gotten the total enrollment uh, numbers of, of the system and raw attendance data numbers wise, not just percentages. Um, we've heard estimates over 150,000 kids have yet to step foot in a building. Um, again, the estimate that I've heard is over 150,000 kids have not stepped foot in a building so far this school year. If the DOE has different numbers and data, please share with me, but just to give you context, that is more than the entire school district of Philadelphia. That is more than the entire school district of Charlotte, North Carolina. 
Um, so does the DOE actually have a number today on how many students have yet to step foot in a school building this school year? I'm going to uh, come off of mute and then call on my colleague, uh, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, who may have some insight to, to add to your query. Uh, yes. Let's, un let's uh, unmute Deputy Chancellor Robinson, uh, sure, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. I am um, unmuted at this time. Uh, Chair, we monitor attendance carefully every single day. It is in the form of a uh, percentage. Um, we have seen an uptick in um, attendance since the start of the school year, and we continue to see stronger attendance. Um, we've grown by 3% um, to be specific. Uh, we will have that information available at the end of this month in alignment with the October 31st date. And as soon as we get the information, I'm happy to have that available to you and all of council as well. And look, and Deputy Chancellor, I appreciate your service. Uh, I, I, you have really been spearheading the efforts for us to get more social workers and supports for kids. And I deeply appreciate that. Um, I, I just know in my background as a teacher, and I'm sure Councilman Barron and others know that October is more, is more of a register budgetary month for schools that if a child is marked absent at least once, uh, um, uh, marked present, I'm sorry, at least once in a, 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 during the month of October, the school gets funded for the child. So it's more of a budgetary bureaucratic uh, situ situation for schools. But I'm fairly certain that when I took attendance, I would, uh, I would have my Delaney book, Deputy Chancellor, uh, but then I'd also have my, my bubble sheets mm -hmm. and those bubble sheets would go down uh, and they would get, get scanned into ATS and ATS has, you know, there's a central database, so the DOE knows. And so that's why, you know, I respectfully ask if, if the number, is that, is that number accurate? 150,000 kids have not come into a building. Is that, does that sound, does that sound right? Is there, a, is there a number that you have you can clarify for the record? Um, I do not have a number for the record. I can certainly get you more information there. What I have seen um, unofficially, that number is far, far from um, accurate. Um, but again, we would like to have the, the data available to you and to all accounts at the end of this month. Anything that I provide at this point uh, would be unofficial. Schools are still in a data cleaning process. And I think um, the tension is coming out with a number that's inaccurate because we know that schools are still doing this important work. But I know we will have that number soon. Um, you know, the number that you're suggesting, I don't know where that comes from, but that is very inaccurate from some of the unofficial data that um, I'm seeing on the ground and it's, it's, it's changing daily. Um, so it would be premature for us to release anything at this point. Right. Uh, when, when the mayor talked about in the opening, after the opening week about the averages in the 80s percentage wise, if you apply that to a number of total kids in the school system, I guess that's how some folks are trying to come up with, with these numbers. It's just, um, I know speaking to principals that there are some schools that had attendance in, 40, in the 40s, percentage wise, in the 40s. Um, that's, that's serious. That is, that is a very alarming number that no one, and I, I know I'm not suggesting anyone here is, but no one should just say that that's just, that's just a, a minimal thing. That's very serious. Um, Absolutely, 100% agree with that. And we do have more targeted areas where we're supporting, such as like in our transfer school communities, for example, we have our overage undercredited scholars. As you know, sir, I was a transfer school principal and we have historically, um, you know, been had to provide additional supports for attendance there. What we're seeing across our school system, we're averaging about 88% um, attendance at this point. And right now we actually have um, an attendance awareness campaign. We are focused on every student every day. It's a part of the community school strategy, which has been researched um, by the RAND Corporation. We have proven strategies that we know work that we're lifting across the city. We're seeing early gains. We're above where we were last year. And we're really trying to make a full recovery to get all of our young people back um, in our school communities and working closely 
uh, with our BCOs, with our principals, attendance teams, attendance teachers, and families to make it happen. Um, and in closing, and then I'll move on to my colleagues, is that um, there are there are schools, and I appreciate them, that understand the gravity of the moment, uh, who hear from families every day that they're still nervous to send their kids back into school, particularly of our younger children who are not a vaccination age. And some schools are on their own providing other options for those families during this time just to remain connected to them. And I wanna to say to them, I hear them, I see them, and I appreciate them because they put their safety of their children and the connection with their kids first and foremost. Um, but not every community has that capacity and the resources to do that. And that's why it's up to us to ensure that that opportunity is across the board for every kid and family until there's a vaccine, until there's for everyone. But I'm gonna move on in the mind, mindfulness of my, my colleagues of time. So uh, Malcolm, please call the next council member. Thank you, Chair. Next, we're going to turn to Council Member Miller. If we can go ahead and unmute Council Member Miller. Your time will begin. Council Member, do you see the invite to be unmuted? Councilmember Miller, we can't hear yeah, you. Could you bring the invite? There, up? Can you hear me now? The, yep, go ahead. We can hear you now. Okay. So, so uh, I, I want to thank uh, the chair. This is a, a, a very, very important hearing that that's being held, and and to DOE and administration uh, that is here. And congratulations to Councilmember Barron. I know that school was was long overdue. Um, I, so I have a couple of quick questions. And um, about staff uh, replacement, obviously substitutes, but there's also um, so many other uh, 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 individuals within the school building uh, um, that uh, it appears to be a, uh, a shortage of, of replacements uh, available and it's having an impact of, of principals having to really uh, on the fly make adjustments because they they they, uh, they need four or five substitutes. They may get one. Sometimes they they get none, and then that, there's not necessarily the continuity around uh, the supports that are necessary in order for them to to make these things happen. So um, what I want to really speak to uh, ask the first question is uh, support services that ensure that when teachers are asking for a substitute, whether it's teachers, or whether it's parents or other staff within the school community, um, what is the likeliness um, that uh, they will have that, uh, those, those, those positions will be replaced and, and, and uh, 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 a, a more unlikely situation, but you know, for those who are, are to have been taken off of pay payroll in whatever capacity, um, what then is uh, uh, what uh, leeway does the, the principal have in in, uh, in in hiring someone else uh, in, in a uh, uh, a more long term uh, status, if any? So thank you, Council Member Miller. I'm going to. Uh, start on the first question and then pivot to Lauren. In terms of the staff that are requested by principals in, in buildings for uh, fulfilling uh, responsibilities, whether it be teachers or paraprofessionals or, or other support staff, the, the system that principals have been utilizing um, to request that is, is in place, they know, they know how to use it. If a staff member, uh, a sub does not, uh, show for some uh, reason, the principals can uh, contact their borough office and the borough office will be um, helpful in uh, the quick dispatch of support 
to that school to ensure that they can complete the program that they have for that day in the best uh, way possible. That is what we have in place. That is where uh, we are relying on two things. Uh, a principal, first of all, as Lauren mentioned earlier, um, maybe utilizing staff within their school in different ways, like a, a teacher teaching an extra period or other staff being uh, uh, shifted around in the, in the building for the day. That is something principals are very, very used to. Uh, we also have the substitute pool. We then also have the uh, the call to the BCO by the principal to ensure that they can get additional staff to uh, create the best uh, learning conditions for that day uh, as possible. And I'll turn to Lauren for your second uh, question, which was around uh, the staff that's off payroll and the ability of that school to um, create some kind of long-term employment uh, in the place of that. Thank you, Donald. So um, a couple things that I would say on that one, just in terms of the support that our substitutes get, um, as I mentioned, the in recruiting our substitutes, we are really starting from um, individuals who have experience with us and with our kids. Uh, and that could be uh, recent graduates from teacher ed programs or student teachers from individuals who previously student taught with us, uh, as well as certified teachers and applicants. Um, and these, the overwhelming majority of the subs in our pool have previous experience with our students. And these are the staff who helped us, not just in person during last school year, but also during the recs before that and some arising this year. Um, so they are uh, very familiar with our school communities. Um, in terms of uh, for longer term needs, uh, what we have done so far is we uh, gave initial allocations to schools to support this um, immediate period following the implementation of the mandate knowing that there's a lot of flux in the data right now. But for schools that do know now that they have longer term needs, they can work with their borough office to uh, do longer term leave replacements for those positions as well. Well, in, 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 the, in the shorter or longer term, um, does the budget, the, 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 the school current budget support the uh, additional substitutes? Where does that yeah. money come from? Is the DOE providing that or is that coming out as Yes, we allocated additional funding for that. And um, if if the needs that schools have to backfill those roles on a short term or long term basis exceed what we have given so far, they just let us know and we are able to uh, increase those budgets as well. Okay, thank you. And then, and then finally, on on the, on the issue of, um, of of social distancing. Uh, I know that we don't have uh, uh, universal classroom size, sizes in terms of dimensions of the classroom. Uh, some classrooms are a little larger than others. Uh, in the case that I, I have a couple of schools that have significantly more uh, students than they had last year and obviously enrolled. Um, uh, and they were being, the, the teachers' desks were actually moved out of the classroom in order for them to teach in order to maintain uh, sufficient social distance, which we're not sure if that is even the case. But that being said, do you know, how do we approach that? And do we really expect teachers to teach without desk? Um, Councilman Miller, Clara, point of clarification, teachers teaching without their own desks or student desks? Was I heard, Malcolm? Uh, I think he was just tried unmuting him. Um, uh, up yeah, here, yeah. here is. <laughs> so, so it is with 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 their desk being moved, their desk and other uh, uh, necessary uh, resources and equipment as well being moved out of the way. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that. First of all, the uh, teacher's desk really is is it's a great luxury to have in the, in the room but we also realize that in order to maximize space in order to make sure that we put first and foremost the students in that room um a teacher's desk is not really required um there have been instances around schools around the city where other provisions have been made for other storage where necessary, uh, where investigated and found that it was critical to do so for operations. But teacher's desk, are, that 
that frees up space, council member, so that we can have more students in uh, and, uh, and definitely driving what our goal is, just to make sure that we are educating the students, keeping them as safe as possible. Um, I have, my wife was, was a teacher, former teacher. I don't think that she would complain if, if her desk was removed. In fact, in previous years, she did remove her desk because she wanted more space for conferring with students and, and other things. So I, if there is a major issue on that council member, would you please let us know which teachers are concerned about not having a desk so we can investigate what the need um, is and vis-a-vis -vis the space that they have so that we can try to create the best possible teaching situation for them as they maximize the learning opportunities for students. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, Chair. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Miller. Thank you, Councilor Miller. Sure. And next, Malcolm, we'll next, turn sorry. to uh, Council Member Levin. If we can go ahead and unmute Council Member Levin. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you very much to the um, representatives from the administration who are here. Um, I have a question about um, just. I have a, I, I know some part, somebody who um, ended up having an educational neglect case called on them because their child, this was during remote learning last year, um, um, because their child um, uh, wasn't able to log in. It was, the child was, was fairly young um, and, um, and so was having, you know, um, trouble sitting in front of the computer screen all day um and in addition to that the, the child had an iep that they needed um uh resources that were not being offered at the at the time of their school um uh, uh you know according to their iep um what is what right now is is uh doe's um uh orientation towards uh working with families um, who are having attendance issues so that they don't end up, you know, getting an educational neglect case, because obviously that's a, not for the benefit of anybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of short things and then I'm gonna to point to LaShawn to answer that question for me shortly is lots of patience, lots of grace, understanding, support driven by uh, a case by case situation and then uh, making sure that we do protect the, the child and protect the family uh, because we understand what the cases are as we try to improve uh, the uh, likelihood of attendance. Um, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for raising this very important issue. Our focus last year, as well as this year, is on making sure that every student and family um, is safe and comfortable coming back to school. We have shared previously um, that under the, uh, I believe it's the New York uh, Social Services Law um, and the New York Family Courts Act, an initial delay and in reaching families um, to get them to re-engage with schools is not a cause to report educational neglect. We've been working closely um, with uh, ACS to ensure that the right training is happening um, out in schools and school leaders and teachers and others understand um, the gravity of the situation and um, the law surrounding educational neglect. In fact, before calling in a report to the state central registry, school staff must make every effort to ascertain a reason why a student is not attending school. Um, if the school notices that, you know, based on the data that their ch our child has not been attending, the school must conduct extensive outreach, provide resources to re-engage the student and the family um, with this, within the school, and we'll continue to work with schools to ensure that these processes are well understood. I mean, I know in this instance, the person the family was was surprised because to hear you describe it just just now you would think that like a family if they had if they got to the stage where they had an educational neglect case called on them they they would it would be pr pretty well expected because they would have gone through a process with the school and if, but but when i talked to this family they were surprised that the educational neglect case was called on them 
and um, and so it kind of leads me to believe that that maybe they, that in that instance there weren't um, kind of this robust set, set of uh, outreaches that 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 you described. And I, I would. I'm not um, familiar with this individual piece, um, but we have you know uh, communicated guidance to the field last year, this year as well. We have conducted um, extensive uh, professional learning in this area. Um, mm -hmm. We have worked closely with uh, ACS, data department, and others to make sure that we're paying attention to this important matter um, and really putting the onus on us to engage in the extensive efforts and interventions to re-engage the family and the student. That is how we are leading um, in this space right. this year. Right. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I would be interested if, if it's possible um, to get some data on how on on the number of cases called into SDR and on um, and maybe I have to need to get this from ACS, but number of cases called into SDR for educational neglect, um, you know, by month to see what the trends are. Um, um, I mean, I know one other aspect of this case was that it was um, it had you know some of the um, you know, wraparound services and in the in the IEP that were not being met, and that was one of the reasons cited in the in the in the in the um, SCR report, and um, and and those those particular resources, I think it was speech therapy, were not were not actually available at the time. Yeah, I don't I don't know the specific case, but if yeah. um, I would be interested if you'd like to connect offline, I'm happy to sure. take a look and provide additional support. And then just sorry, Chair, this uh, very briefly, um, in terms of the number of teachers um, that are, the percentage of teachers that are, that are, have, have one shot where, I, you might've said this before, but what's, what's the percentage right now? Are you speaking to the chair? Oh, no, I, well, I'm speaking to any of the representatives from, from DOE if they want to speak to that. Oh, right. Lauren? Thank you. Uh, it's 96% of teachers have received at least one shot. And, and, and any teacher that hasn't received the shot obviously can receive it at any point in time and return to the classroom, correct? Absolutely. Um, and have I just have what's what is so for those remaining four percent of teachers that have not received the shot do we have feedback as to why they haven't received the shot why they continue to um to to um be reluctant so i would say generally that the um that the teachers and staff in general who are not uh where we don't have a record of vaccination fall into a couple of groups. Some have received um, exemptions or accommodations related to the vaccine. And in those instances, they would obviously remain on payroll. Um, then uh, the second group would be uh, individuals who are, for other reasons, having nothing to do with the vaccine are already on a leave um, and therefore don't need to get vaccinated yet. Um, for the third group of others uh, who have not been vaccinated, I can't speak to exactly why they um, would be making that choice, um, but those are just generally the groups that they fall into. Can I ask, do you have a number of the, the teachers in the third group or teachers or other school staff that are in that third group? Uh, not offhand, but I'd be happy to follow up with that. Okay, because that's really the number that if someone has a medical exemption or some other kind of religious exemption, that's mm -hmm. one thing. If they're if they're on some other kind of leave, that's, you know, obviously that's, that's another consideration. But if we're talking, I mean, I think that it's important to kind of drill down on what exactly that number is of people who can, are required to, don't have an exemption, and are still not doing it. I think that that would be an important um, uh, number to examine. Okay, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd be glad to, to get that information. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Levin, uh, Chair Traeger. No other council members have questions, so I'm going to turn it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. I just want to go back to a couple of things from, from the health department and uh, Dr. Wong. Um, 
uh, to both the uh, health uh, deputy health commissioner and Dr. Wonga, is is it is it correct to say that uh, uh, staff that is vaccinated could get uh, reinfected uh, with with COVID? Can, can they are there reinfection breakers? Is that correct? Yeah, that is that's correct. It could happen. Uh, no vaccine is a hundred percent, but it actually happens at a much lower uh, rate than if, say, someone is unvaccinated. Right. And Dr. Wong, you, you agree with that? Absolutely. Right. Uh, so we hear that, and I heard from both, everyone here, that testing is still a very key part of the multi-layered strategy and approach. We've just heard that you could get uh, reinfected even if you're vaccinated. Um, why am I hearing that there are teachers who are vaccinated in their schools being denied testing in their schools uh, after there was a breakthrough case. Uh, this is not a DOE question. This is a health department and Dr. Wong question. Why are vaccinated staff who want to do the right thing and get tested in their school after one of their colleagues tested positive? Why, I, I, first of all, are you aware that this is happening? And what, what are your thoughts as public health officials? So I, I'm not aware of the specific case that you're speaking to, Chair Traeger. Um, but, you know, uh, Dr. Long had talked about, you know, sort of our, our surveillance plan that we have for unvaccinated um, students. Um, but certainly an individual who is seeking to get tested, we do have testing resources and we always talk about our ability to sort of ramp up our surveillance testing. But we have ample testing in our community through all the ways that Test and Trace offers it. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, that we always want to message where folks can get tested isn't just limited at the school, but at all the different sites that, uh, that T2 has. Yeah, and what I would add, and I appreciate the question, Chair Traeger, because um, you know, anybody that wants to get tested to keep our city safe, um, we, are, we couldn't support that more. Um, for, you know, across New York City now, not just schools and teachers, but we want to make sure that we have access to testing for any New Yorker. In particular, anybody that's a close contact, we offer at-home testing for. So if you're a student or teacher that's a close contact that we've identified through contact tracing, we offer to bring testing into your home free of charge uh, every single time. Um, so we really do want to try to tear down as many barriers as we can. One of the um, a little nuances, but is important from a public health standpoint is, um, well, two things. One, when we're offering testing at our schools, which is once a week, um, it's to look for a signal to see if we think there's ongoing transmission going on at the school. Uh, that means that if you were, so let's say Chair Traeger, let's say you're still teaching high school and you were exposed yesterday and the testing team is there today and you want to get tested, CDC says you need you should wait till day between days three and five because it's too early for you to have incubated the virus to have a positive test from your exposure. So because we're only there one day a week with the weekly testing teams, we do, it is important that you still get tested in the window of time where you would be positive. So getting tested the next day is too soon. You, you can't possibly be positive uh, being tested the next day after an exposure. So what we do to help with that is again, offer things like at-home testing to anybody that's been exposed, that's a close contact, and having arguably the strongest testing infrastructure in the country here in New York City. And if there are any communities where um, you feel like you don't have enough testing resources or you want more, including uh, your communities, Chair Traeger, anything you're hearing, I hope you've had the experience with us that we're extremely responsive. Nothing makes me happier. We built a mobile fleet of units only for the purpose of being able to be more responsive to our communities that need us the most. So let us know where we need to be. Um, and you know, as long as you accept the public health guidance that we're sharing, which is that there's a window of time that's that critical time to get tested in your example of being a vaccinated close contact. But we wanna make it as easy as possible to get tested. We wanna to come to your home, bring our mobile units to your community, let me know where to be. And I hope we've always been, been able to deliver to you in the past. And I, I offer you my same commitment now. Well, I appreciate the answer, Dr. Wong. It's just the reason why I asked this question is because I'm told that this is the policy that only unvaccinated can get tested. Um, and we've just heard both you and your colleagues say that vaccinated can get reinfected. So why is the policy that the testing only is applicable for the unvaccinated? Yeah, I, I could start and I'll turn to Dr. E. Sterling there. Um, so this is per CDC's guidance. And I'll explain the rationale that CDC has used in their evaluation of evidence to come to the conclusion you just stated perfectly. 
So CDC says that surveillance testing should be done on unvaccinated people, with the predominant reason being that the reason we do surveillance testing with the same 10% random sample, the same protocols at every school, is so that we can look comparatively and see if we can detect a signal rising, maybe in one school that wouldn't be in, in another school too. If you add vaccinated people into the mix, you're going to bias your sample because we know that fortunately, if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to get the virus, to go to the hospital, and to, um, to potentially die from the virus. So if we included uh, in our random sample people that were vaccinated, we'd be biasing ourselves against finding the cases that are important to find in our schools to see where there might be a signal of ongoing transmission going on in our schools. That's why, that's why the CDC recommends that, and that's why we believe that's the right way to do it. But for any vaccinated teachers, again, if you're a close contact, we'll come to your house, or you can come to the, any of our sites with the strongest testing infrastructure. Uh, I'll put my foot forward there again, you know, in the whole country. And if that's not enough, let me know where we need to be, and we'll be there. Uh, so, Dr. Wong, Los Angeles health officials uh, might beg to differ with you on these matters because there they are requiring vaccination and they're requiring testing. It's not optional. Um, and so, are you saying that? Because I think if I heard you correctly, that that's you're not getting an accurate picture. I think Los Angeles is just prioritizing bottom line safety. And they're making sure that they're getting the, you know, uh, I, are you familiar with the Los Angeles uh, school district's policy of requiring vaccination and, and testing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and again, the CDC does acknowledge in their guidance. Um, and again, the, the CDC represents to us so the totality of all of the evidence um, uh, across you know, the country, if not the world. And the CDC does say that you can go um, you know, beyond their recommendations in different directions. But the, what we're doing here in New York City, which, by the way, is really one of the, the main bases for the CDC um, forming the policies that they have, because they saw how safe our schools were last year. And I talked a little bit about when we studied students and teachers in school versus at home. But I'll read you two quick quotes here. I promise I'll be quick. Um, so CDC says, uh, direct quote, 10% of students who are not fully vaccinated, quote one. Quote two, uh, offer screening testing for students who are not fully vaccinated at least once per week. So per those two things, we're directly in line with what the CDC says. Um, but as things change, our testing infrastructure is very adaptable. We look at the numbers every day um, and we'll be, uh, we can adapt to any changes that we need to almost instantaneously in the future. Yeah, Dr. Wong, just to wrap up on this point, yeah. um, I, I seriously question our testing infrastructure. I, especially after what I've heard today and have not heard today also, uh, we have got the overwhelming majority of kids in our system have not provided consent to get tested. More than 500,000 of our kids in our system are uh, in the elementary school age where there is still no vaccine. So as far as I'm concerned, we have a very inadequate uh, testing uh, structure and, and, and program. Uh, I do wanna just qu quickly get to school bus drivers. Um, is, is, uh, would, would you agree that school bus drivers also are in contact with students that, that they transport to school uh, during portions of the day? Would, would, would you agree and acknowledge that? I, I, well, Dr. Yes. Ethan, I, I've been talking a lot, yeah. Yes, I agree too. And at DOE, yeah. I think maybe they should, can also weigh in to make sure they agree as well. Well, the only question is, is that I've been asked by parents that the mandate for vaccination uh, does not apply for school bus uh, drivers and, and, and school staff, school bus staff. Uh, can anyone speak to that? Well, well, I'll start, um, but you know, this is, as we have talked about before, uh, you know, certainly starting with our DOE uh, teachers and principals and, and staff in school, but certainly we do, we're not done and we're looking at ways that we can climb the ladder to include um, additional roles. Uh, but we're watching the data closely, and I think this is going to be our approach going forward. So is it correct to say that you are considering soon requiring the mandate to, to be extended to school bus staff as well? well I think maybe we can go back to, well, I, I'll say quickly, uh, Chair Traeger, as a fellow, uh, again, worse version of a teacher than you, I'm certainly not a school bus driver, but I defer to DOE in understanding uh, the dynamics and their policies there. So maybe we can go back to the first deputy. 
So I'll start out, and if uh, any of my colleagues from DOE want to jump in, I just want to say that uh, we do acknowledge that uh, uh, bus drivers have to play their part in, in the maintenance of safety, and we continue to work with the bus companies to make sure that the drivers and, and or attendants are in compliance with the mask requirements. So when we hear of that lack of compliance, and we work directly with the bus companies to rectify that, um, we've been seeing a... Uh, I would say overall very positive uh, busing operations happening across the city um, in terms of the uh, bus drivers and the matrons uh, wearing their mask and making sure that they can contribute to the overall health of the students uh, they're transporting. Uh, Lauren or anyone else, if you wanna to add to that, please do. Okay, I think we're good there. Um, oh, okay. I just, I, I know this hearing is about health safety protocols, the vaccine mandate implementation, but I can go on an entire new hearing on school bus issues, uh, Deputy Chancellor, because uh, I will tell you that I'm very disappointed in a number of school bus companies that are not doing right by our kids. But I, I, I don't want to I'm going to stick to the topic here at hand. I, I want a, a clarifying question on uh, for, for Warren Siciliano. Warren, um, correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, uh, can a substitute person say no to placement in a school? That, that's correct. So um, the way the way subcentral works, uh, schools indicate. Schools use Subcentral to uh, identify substitutes for placement in their school. Um, and so the substitute accepts the, the position. So the substitute has to, uh, can opt not to accept the position. Is that correct? That's correct. So when the mayor and the chancellor, everyone says that there are thousands who are signed up, I believe that. I think, I, I get that. But when I, when I report that there are folks who are reporting to me, principals reporting to me that they have not receive the staff, you're saying that one possibility is that they're saying no to the placement. Is that correct? Uh, it, it could be that they are, um, it, it's not really a placement, but it could be that they, uh, they are not able to source substitutes for that job. That is absolutely a possibility, um, which is why substitutes are not the only tool that we have um, and why we're constantly growing the pool particularly using nominations directly from schools because those are individuals that the school has a relationship with and are already tied to that school community. So uh, in addition to growing the substitute pool with those individuals, we will of course continue to support with um, uh, funding for additional coverages and for existing staff to be able to support the, the schools as well. And do you have data with you, Warren, on how many nomination letters you're currently processing, reviewing, waiting to get back? To principals, because I will tell you, this has probably been one of the biggest reasons for phone calls from school leaders is that they're waiting for nomination letters to get processed. Yeah. So as I said, the once someone is nominated, there are a couple of steps that need to happen, and not all are sort of within DOE control. There's uh, once the person is nominated, the uh, the applicant fills out the application. They have to. Uh, fill out a uh, background questionnaire, then they come in and do their prints and then move through the process that way. So um, we are clearing as many of the steps as quickly as we can um, for the ones that you know uh, are sort of uh, under our purview. And at the same time, what we're also gonna be sharing with schools is a reminder on how they can see the status of the person that they've nominated. So if there's additional follow-up that's needed, um, they can either follow up with the substitute or escalate to us that uh, someone has a question that needs to be answered. So we want to so, make sure that that information is incredibly transparent. Um, we constantly follow up with every substitute who is in um, somewhere in the nomination queue to remind them to complete all of the necessary steps as well. Um, but we know that this is a, a real area of interest for folks. And so we want to share that information as, as openly as possible. And last question to Warren, what is the average time for a nomination letter application to get processed? Did you have that? It really varies depending on how quickly each step of the process happens. Um, but uh, making sure that everyone has 
the clearest information on the status and what the next step is, is how we can really drive that time down to as minimal as possible. All right, just to kind of crystallize the point for the, for the folks here and those watching, again, we're talking about mandated service providers for some of our most vulnerable children, kids with IEPs, who are being made more and more, more vulnerable without those critical support services for them. And each day lost, it's, it, it's a lot. You can't get, we're already responsible for a recovery program this year. And it's gonna just deepen that need uh, for compensatory times and services for, for, for schools and staff. Um, look, uh, there's a lot of uh, information that we did not get in today's uh, hearing, which is just as sobering as some of the information that, that we, we, we did get. I wanna again say to all school staff and the health department staff that we appreciate them working incredibly hard every single day um, on behalf of our students and our school communities, but they deserve better. And we certainly deserve a lot more transparency than, we, than, we, than we've had today. Um, uh, I, I still strongly believe, and I, Deputy Chancellor, is I fully agree that there is no substitute for you know, quality in-person instruction. I don't think there's any disagreement about the value of in-person, but we're, we're not in that, we're not in normal times right now. We're not in, in a, in a pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, we're still in a pandemic. Um, and we don't have a vaccine for young children. I pray that there's one immediately, but we're just not there yet. And I am just getting reports and reports and reports of attendance 40%, 50%, 60% from different school communities. I would have loved to have gotten clarification on the number of kids still, still, still enrolled and, and not, not attended yet. So we're left to these anecdotal reports from principals and from school communities across the city. But we need to make sure that we're connecting with all of our kids and, and, and making sure that they all have safe, equitable options. And I said before the start of the school year that you know worksheets and packets are not instruction. Well, in some cases, because of a national steel shortage, I don't want to get, I don't want to get off topic. There's a chip shortage of steel. Some of the laptops promised to schools have not arrived. And that's not, I'm not blaming DOE for that because this is a national, this is a bigger issue than, than just city of New York, but devices have not arrived. So what do some schools have to do? They have to give kids worksheets and packets. And so it's not equitable across the board. I just wanted just to, to leave there. We have a lot more work to do, but I again thank those who came out here testifying. If there's no, Malcolm, there's no additional uh, questions from any of my uh, colleagues, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, well, we will now hear, hear from the public. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. That now concludes um, testimony from the administration. We will now be turning to public testimony. Um, all panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and Zoom will prompt you to accept the unmute. The Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, we ask that pe people please wrap up their comments so we can move on to the next panelists. Council members, as always, if you have questions for any panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order with which you raised your hand after the conclusion of a panel. Our first panel that we will be hearing from will be Michael Mulgrew from the United Federation of Teachers and Donald Nesbitt, Vice President, Local 372, DC 37. We'll first turn to Mr. Mulgrew. Your time will be here. Thank you. And I wanna thank the City Council, especially, uh, Chair Traeger for having this hearing. As we all know, our schools have been under a great challenge since the beginning of this pandemic and our school communities and the staffs inside of them have risen to every, every one of those challenges, including what we just had to deal with this week on Monday with the vaccine mandate. And once again, the schools figured out how to get things done to try to keep children safe. And we're working right now to have more permanent solutions for every one of our schools. But these challenges have been exacerbated recently by changes in policy, specifically uh, from the Department of Health of New York City. Uh, last year, we were very proud to be able to say to everyone in uh, the city and across the country that our schools in New York City were the safest buildings to be in. And thankfully, at this moment, we know that the current, uh, the, the current 
numbers are coming down, uh, which were very cause for great concern for us because now we know that the newest strains, this new strain actually is very harmful to children. And our entire time, people have shown up for work since uh, when we first closed the schools, showing up for work virtually till when we opened our schools last year and we had about 350,000 students till now, people have continually shown up. But to, until this year, uh, it really were the adults who were more at risk. And now we know because of the new strains uh, and because adults and some of our students have access to a vaccination, it's really the children who are more at risk. So when the Department of Health changes its policy about when a classroom sh should be closed versus a partial closure, and when we have children who don't have access to the vaccine, and the fact that they're trying to base partial closures off of close contacts when they themselves say they're not responsible for determining close contacts, and they're saying it's the school's responsibility when nobody at the school has any way of knowing whether a child has close contact. What reading group do we know the child is in? Who do we know when the child is eating lunch, who they're sitting next to? Did the child have to be pulled out to get a support service? All of these things are true. That are, and these are the things that have been very problematic and including they are now do, saying they do not do investigations. So they have no idea if COVID is being transmitted inside of a school community because you showed up there. And these policies that have been changed are disgusting and really should be changed back to what they originally were. And, re and we are the only Department of Health in the city of New York that we know determines that three feet is no longer three feet. Thank you. And next we'll hear from... Oh. Well, I just want to just very quickly uh, say to President Mulgrew, I, I mentioned before my opening and I mentioned certainly closing that we uh, applaud and appreciate that the overwhelming majority, it is nearly almost unanimous of teachers uh, have done the right thing for their health, their family, their community, their schools by getting vaccinated. And even before the mandate, working around the clock beyond contractual hours, because it's, it's, it, it is not, a, it's not an eight to three job. Teachers know this is a 24 seven job. Uh, we, we, we appreciate them, we see them, we hear them. And, and they deserve more than just thanks here on a Zoom meeting. Um, I shared earlier, President Mulgrew, uh, an illustration, a photograph of how, uh, as to what you were just talking about with regards to the distance that uh, from nose to nose, center of a desk, center of a desk. Uh, and uh, it, it is unconscionable to me that that is how they have classified the three feet distance. I, as a teacher, could not get through that space. I am not a public health expert, and we're going to show this again. Thank you, Malcolm. I could not get through that space. So even for pedagogical reasons, that could be even, even an issue or a challenge. But for a public health reason, that is not adequate and safe physical distancing. And this was designed, in my view, to just simply pack the classroom with more desks, more kids. That really goes against the spirit and the letter of public health experts' guidance. And President Mogru, would you agree with that? And can you please add more? Uh, I, I think you're saying it very nicely. Uh, this, is this is absurd. There is nobody in the country, there is not a single doctor in the country that will agree with them. This was done because they want to be able to say that they can bring every child back safely. They're telling us we can fit more children now inside of each classroom in New York City than we have ever done in our history. And when they're trying to say that the D this is the CDC, they are lying. This is not the CDC. Did the, the CDC did not say to measure from nose to nose when people are side by side. That is for when people are facing each other. So somebody needs to hold the Department of Health responsible. How can you tell us that a class that would never have more than 34 students in it can now hold 50? I mean, this is... This is why it was so, I think it, it's so important of what you're doing here today. People need to know that our Department of Health, for some reason, and they should come clean about what the reason is, has decided to make these ridiculous policy changes and are trying to veil it under it's the CDC when it is not. This is them telling us to put people 18 inches from each other and telling us to put our desks to the point where we can't even go up and down the ropes. This has never happened in our city before. This is ridiculous, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. 
And I never would have imagined that we would be having a discussion and a conversation, even a debate, about how do we measure three feet from from people? I mean, this is this has become uh, this. It's 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 not even funny. Uh, it, this is this is life and death. This is serious stuff. I, I just can't believe that they have chosen this path. And I'll also say, President Mulgrew, that Commissioner Dave Choksi came to my hearing on September first with the original policies. And he called it the gold standard. And then not a week later, they changed it. He didn't come today to, to, to today's hearing. Um, no. And folks, I'm, and he would sorry, not. please continue. I'm assuming he would not. Probably likes being on TV too much. What he should be uh, talking about is really what he has done here. This, the, we're, we had a school that went from four positive cases to six to 10 to 12 to 19 to 24 over a period of days. And it was not closed. And this is after these policy changes happened. And the reason they didn't close it was because they said they had no evidence that the spread of the virus was from inside the school. When we asked for the documentation for the tracing, the investigations, they said they don't do that anymore. We said, if you don't do that anymore, then how would you have evidence if the spread happens inside of the school? And they said, well, we won't because we don't do investigations. So, so then why do we even have a regulation that says if we have multiple incidents of spread happening inside a school, you need to close it? Well, President so Mulgrew, we have rigged the system. We, we got our answer to this because they, you know, when I spoke to Commissioner O'Rocker earlier from the Situation Room, uh, she acknowledged that phone calls go until 11 o'clock at night uh, between her staff and school, school community members. Um, and basically, your members and principals and other staff have become de facto contact tracers. They almost were celebrating that. But I pointed out in my training to be a teacher, I never had any public health training to be a contact tracer. Your members certainly are not public health uh, experts, with the exception of, of nur nurses or, or licensed to provide health services. Um, and they acknowledged there was no PD or workshop to even go over this. So basically your members and principals, others, are on the phone going over seating charts, who sat next to who for more than 15 minutes, who, who wore a mask, who, who took off the mask. It is, imp and President Mulgrew, as you know, as the job of a teacher is to educate our kids, keep them safe, supported. It is not to become a de facto contact tracer in the middle of a pandemic. Can you just speak to what, responsibilities teachers are being pulled from at the expense of the negligence of the health department in the city? When the first, this first really became problematic when it was clear that every school in New York City was going to have a problem meeting the three foot rule when we actually meant that three feet was three feet. Okay, there are a lot of schools that could have, were, were gonna be able to comply. The idea was at that moment that we were gonna put in extra layers of protection, extra ventilation, be very aggressive about doing this, but also layer in our test and trace, close cl classrooms where we know we have a positive case, case where students do not have the ability to be vaccinated, and at the same time have those investigations because we don't wanna have spread inside of the buildings. And then literally, in a three-day period, all of that got turned on its head, all of it. And principals started reaching out to us. Teachers started re reaching out. Teachers started sending us pictures. Principals were like, they're asking me who had close contacts. I'm, am I the close contact police? How am I supposed to figure this out? There was no training. It was literally like test and trace just decided, you know what? We're not doing this work anymore. We're not going to give it to you, even though you have no idea how to do it. Uh, and, and that is what's been going on throughout. Uh, and it's a shame because our test and trace facility at one point was a model, and now it's a model for exactly what not to do. And President Mulgrew, last question. Uh, the DOE, again, refused to give us enrollment information and uh, raw numbers in terms of attendance. Uh, we heard a lot of different numbers and estimates. Um, what can you share? You know, I, again, it's their responsibility, not yours, to, to give us the but what can you share what you've heard from membership about concerns with regards to attendance and kids not coming into buildings? Overall, we think we're somewhere between 140,000 and 180,000. Um, but again, uh, we can't get the information. I, I've never heard of the fact that nobody can give in how many children are enrolled in our schools and then how many haven't shown up. 
it, it, it's really not a difficult question. I am assuming because they're worried about people who are saying they still want the remote option, but you shouldn't be, for me, it's, we have to go find those children. That, that's the, you know, if you're asking me as a teacher, what do you do? You play politics and say, don't have any telling anyone exactly what children aren't coming so that they don't get an education for months. Or do you say, all right, let's do the right thing. Let's go find these children and let's try to figure out how to get them comfortable with school. And that's exactly it. This is not a game of gotcha. This is a, this is a matter of how do we best support our children in our school communities. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, as we heard today, they only received about 192,000 uh, testing consent forms. Um, oh and boy. there was a little bit of confusion on their part, whether all of those forms are from unvaccinated students. They kind of, the DOE kind of said, yes, we think, yes, we think. Others didn't want to comment. I have serious questions about that. As far as I'm concerned, we don't really have a full testing program uh, in, in our school system. And I also shared, President Mogru, that your members who did the right thing one of their a colleague tested positive, wanted, and they're vaccinated. They wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to get tested in their school, and they were told no. And they said the testing was only for the unvaccinated. And yeah. we heard the health department today confirm that there are breakthrough infections. Are you aware that members are being turned away in their schools to get yeah. tested? Because last year and in the end of August, we test and trace a group had told us, again, like we did last year, any of your members who want to be uh, tested, we will do it as long as we have the time. And then everything changed in a small period of time. And, and no, now they don't have access to the testing. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do by being tested is we're trying to make sure that because we know we have access to the vaccine, we want to, we're asking to be tested because we're trying to keep our students safe. And they seem to forget that that's the reason why we're asking to be tested. Uh, but everything changed. Um, and there seems to be a major shakeup going over on over at Test and Trace. And it's just not what it was by any means. In fact, now it's just turned into a source of anger and frustration versus, uh, a, you know, a very important piece of keeping our school community safe, which it was last year. Yes. And in closing, President Mulgrew, uh, I they mentioned October the end of October is when they'll have a, a number available for attendance enrollment. And I reminded them that again, being a former teacher, uh, you can do a very quick fact check that you know, every day I had my Delaney book, I had my bubble sheets, we took attendance, scanned it into ATS, that was sent over to Central. It is unfathomable to me and insulting to, to this committee, to the public, that they will not share the attendance uh, data and, and information. And I appreciate your continued push for greater transparency and accountability yeah. on behalf of the kids, not just your members, but this is something really important. I don't think you just fight for your members. The questions and issues you're raising are really for the broader school communities and communities at large. So I wanna thank you, President Mulgrew, for your leadership on that. Yeah, and, and on the attendance piece, Mark, you and I both know because uh, we worked in the Department of Ed, they have an attendance figure for every day. They know how many kids didn't show up. And the reason they're saying is the end of October is that's when they're required by the state to tell the state. So they are hiding this. And the sad part is if children are missing and become LTAs, never show up, they are then removed from our registers. And what we should be doing right now as a city, like we had teachers who volunteered and this summer were no door knocking families uh, in the community where they work. We should be doing that right now. But again, again, and, but again, we're playing this little game of I'm not going to tell you what's wrong because I don't politically it might not work for us. And this all comes down to mayoral control, as we all know. On that note, that, that's a very powerful note to end it on. Thank you, President Moger, for your leadership and being here today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, next, Malcolm, please. Uh, next on this panel, we'll hear from Donald Nesbitt, Vice President of Local 372, DC 37. If we can unmute Mr. Nesbitt. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Education Chair uh, Traeger, for holding this very, very important hearing today. Uh, thank you to the members of the committee as well. 
Um, I, I did submit a, a testimony uh, which explains our position, but I'm going to just go over some things um, in uh, doing my testimony today. So I want to say in listening to uh, some of the testimony earlier today, we are witnessing some of the same incompetence that we witnessed at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we have not, the DOE, the city administration has not learned um, from, from what happened then. Um, I want to say a remote option is definitely something that we need to do in schools. Um, testing is definitely something that we need to do in schools. Um, we have C CDC guidelines, but why are we not going above and beyond? I want to say the guidelines are just the minimum. Um, my own son came home from school um, and he said that his first comment on the first day of school was that we're too close to one another. Um, so I told him to use his arms and, and his distance, um, and that's how far he should be from someone. But not every student is 6'4 with a 6'6 six, um, six wingspan, right, and able to do that. Um, um, so those are some concerns. Um, we look at the numbers and we look at some of the members that I represent. Uh, school food employees, I want to say uh, we were at the beginning of the school year already down um, a thousand employees from the beginning of last school year. Uh, we have lost some due to the vaccine mandate. Um, I myself yesterday went into a school up in the Bronx where I put away a food delivery, a $3,000 food delivery in a school kitchen because the staff just had the cook and a helper um, doing double operations and moving food to classrooms. And the principal in that school was very helpful and the educators were very helpful in actually spreading some of that operation where more children were able to come to the cafeteria. But that actually adds to the cafeteria being more expired. crowded. Um, uh, I'll, I'll finish up uh, quickly. No, no, you, um, you may continue, Mr. Nesbitt, please continue. Okay, we also represent um, workers who work in the central office uh, where we saw the mayor's mandate for September 13th for our workers to re were ordered back into offices where social distance protocols were actually canceled um, by the mayor. Signs were removed, partitions were removed um, in those offices. Um, and even while he was still pushing to us that the Delta variant was, was dangerous um, and that it was killing folks um, and, that, and that we should uh, push for more people to be vac vaccinated, he removed some of these protocols. Um, and that just jeopardizes the trust level. I want to say a lot of workers, even though uh, with the vaccine mandate, we haven't been encouraging our members to be vaccinated. I want to say there is still some anxiety amongst workers on decisions that they had to make so swiftly um, on health decisions. I want to say the people that I represent are mainly Black, Latino, and uh, a majority of women. Um, and there were some serious questions. Uh, when we hear reports of the vaccine in very rare cases where it, this inflammation of, of, heart, of the heart um, and Black and Latinos die at higher rates um, from, from heart disease, um, there are questions that just weren't answered. I wanna um, reiterate what Councilman Dinowitz and what um, Council Member Barron said, that there needs to be transparency, education, and People need to realize that there is hesitancy within the Black community um, around taking the vaccine. So I hope as we push towards vaccinated students that we are also educating families um, around what the vaccine um, actually does. Um, I gotta say some of our members who were hesitant, um, I went over reading material with them around mRNA and what it does to the body. And I pushed this to some of the members and they, after reading the material, they felt better about it. I wanna say in a school system where we take training on bloodborne pathogens, on OSHA, we take OSHA training, we mandate sexual harassment training in a, in a situation in a pandemic where it has killed more people than we have ever seen in our school system. Why did we not move towards uh, PowerPoints and different instruction on the computer for staffers within the school, for families um, that would have made um, this situation much better around a mandate. I visited the school on Monday when the mandate went into effect only to see a school lunch helper um, brought out of the school by police and EMS because she simply just wanted to be on the job and service the children um, that was there. And she felt that um, it, it was her religious beliefs um, not to um, take the, the vaccine. 
Um, I think a lot of that falls on the lack of education that went into um, into um, um, education and teaching um, some of the folks within our school communities. I felt that the city can, could have done a much, much better job, but it is a sad situation where that same employee, we look at, we clap for her in the school food employees at 7 p.m. Uh, throughout this pandemic, only for her to be brought out by police and EMS on Monday. Um, that is a sad situation in the city. And I think if we're moving where we agree, the vaccine is the safest way for us to get to where we need to be. There needs to definitely be an effort on more education uh, to families because families in the Black and Latino community are going to be hesitant on push on, 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 on a vaccine and, and putting the vaccine into their children. And I think we, we cannot just um, push it to the side and say, hey, if you take this medication, then you should be comfortable with this. I think that we should educate, educate, um, educate families before we move um, towards these type of things. I feel the city has failed on doing those those things that they should have done. Thank you, thank you, Chair, uh, for the opportunity uh, to come before the committee um, and just express um, these these feelings today. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Vice President and and Espen. And Thank you to, to your entire team and to all, all your members for uh, always being critical, essential workers and for even throughout the entire summer, continuing to provide meals for families and services. And um, uh, you, you raise very powerful points. Um, and one of the things that I think is critical um, is education is absolutely critical, but also building and maintaining trust during a crisis. And if you look at the pattern of this administration going back to last year. I mean, first of all, we, we lost the previous health commissioner uh, because I argue that politics did get away, did get in the way of public health choices and, and decisions. Um, and even now, September 1st, the health commissioner testifies at my hearing that this is the gold standard package of protection to keep students and staff safe. And not even a week later, they completely undo the gold standard, they don't even send the people here to testify to defend it. They just say that they changed it and, and so forth. How does that maintain and build trust in the communities that, you're, that we're all serving and talking about? It further erodes trust. And so you need to maintain and build trust and hear from public health experts, or as they say, follow the science from public health experts. Uh, but this administration, unfortunately, uh, dropped the ball. And, and, and today, we heard testimony or, and didn't hear some testimony that we, we really don't have a testing program, uh, which means in many schools, we'll, we'll be testing the same small number of kids every single month that return the forms. And that's it. Parents that I speak to uh, uh, tell me, parents that I speak to tell me they have not uh, been pushed or encouraged by their schools to return the forms. When the DOE wants forms back from parents, they know how to do an all out blitz. When they want those parent learning surveys, uh, when they want those, uh, the lunch forms in the past, they know, they used to come to my door and say, Mr. Traeger, uh, we need these number of lunch forms back because lunch forms were important to our budget as well for, for Title I uh, purposes. When they want something, they know, they know how to get it. I have not heard any push. How many times does the mayor go on TV and say, uh, parents, please send in your test and consent form. It's, it's, it's over. And so, it's, so uh, I, Mr. Nesbitt, I hear you and I, I, I appreciate your powerful words testimony. It's education and also maintaining trust and building and trying to earn the trust of communities that we have failed over yeah. and over again historically. So thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Can I make uh, one more comment around the, yes, please. Around, around the exemptions, if we can also look at those, uh, we have situations that where we have heard, uh, I'll give you one example, a parent coordinator um, who got COVID during August, during the month of August, from she got it in the school building. Um, she, she filed for an exemption because her doctor told her that she can't get the vaccine within 90 days um, of her exposure because the antibody levels are too high, she was actually denied an exemption. 
Um, we 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 have to look look at these because I think whereas the DOE is pushing to say we're giving religious and uh, medical exemptions, um, their criteria um it just doesn't add up, right? Someone who got COVID in a school building is denied after their doctor told them that they can't receive it until their ninety day period has passed. So if we can look at that as well. Thank you, Mr. Nasser. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Um, now, actually, Councilmember Riley has a question for this panel, oh. so if we can go ahead and unmute. Council yes, Councilmember Riley. Riley, and also want to publicly thank Councilmember Riley for also being an incredible partner and ally uh, in this effort for our, to keep our kids and staff safe and for remote option for our families too. Councilmember Riley, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger, and I, I'm going to start off with that first. Uh, we desperately need a remote option uh, for our students. I'm going to say that on the record. I'm going to continue saying that. Uh, because we are not prepared for what's um, coming. Actually, Brother Nesbitt was in my district yesterday, and actually the school he's referring to is my daughter's school. So you could kind of see the resources that were pulled um, into bringing this food uh, within the school uh, that was kind of taken away from the other schools where they could have been assisting other students. Um, this is a concern uh, that we continue, continue to press on the DOE and it's like we are playing politics and this is really sickening because we're playing with our children's lives and we're playing with my child's life, uh, which I don't wanna play with. Uh, so with that being said, I, I just would like to commend um, uh, the UFT president, uh, Michael Mulgrew uh, and also uh, Donald Nesbitt uh, for your continuing work that you have been doing. Uh, you haven't been given a lot and your members have been doing um, what they should be, what they have been doing for our students to make sure that they're kept safe. But the DOE has to step up. Um, we need a remote option. We need an option for our students to feel safe. Uh, speaking to some certain parents, and I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I was at another event earlier, so I didn't get to uh, give my testimony to the DOE, but just wanted to uh, let this known on the record. Speaking to uh, many students, um, speaking to teachers within my district, um, they do feel like they aren't getting any support. Um, especially from the DOE. So we really need to uh, put some pressure on them and the mayor's office to make sure that we are given the remote option. Um, when it comes to the mandate, we knew the Delta variant was there prior to us going back to school. And we knew that this mandate would take place. This is something that should have been uh, mandated prior to us going back to school so we could properly uh, make sure that we're taking care of our students. So just want to put it on the record and thank you all uh, for your fight. And Chair, thank you so much. You're amazing. Um, you're really a trailblazer and you're really fighting for our students and our parents and our teachers. Thank you. Well, Councilman Riley, I, I want to say ditto to you because I want the public to know that I appreciate my colleagues that actually uh, don't just, uh, and, and he, he certainly has, he has a great self-care social media presence. He does great things. He visits schools. He actually goes to his communities. He speaks to teachers, to parents, to kids. Uh, he, he's raising a beautiful family. He, he's, he's on the ground. And that means so much in the city council to have leaders that actually know what they're talking about and, and, and really see it and feel it every day. So thank you, Councilman Riley, for your leadership and partnership. R really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear Malcolm. Yep, thank you for that panel. The next panel that we'll be calling on, uh, we'll be hearing from Lucas Healy, from Paulette Healy, Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools, or Press NYC, Liz Rosenberg, Press NYC, and Kaliris Salas, Press NYC Community Education Council 4. The panel after that will be Tanisha Grant, Jennifer Goddard, Amy Sai, and Rashida Brown Harris. We'll first start with Lucas Healy. Your time will begin. Can you hear me? If you could speak up just a little bit louder. Sorry, sir. There we go. Well, my name is Lucas Healy and I'm a D75 student. Um, I'm striking until remote options is restored. Uh, I thank you, Councilman Traeger, for, for listening to our families. Please uh, need to prioritize 
Nice are safe safety over many lies. We have have heard from the DOE and the DOH. Uh, for, the past three hours. Uh, for the past three hours. Well, and I trust them. And I trust them, I trust them less, less than I did before. Than I did before. Well, it is especially unsafe now that my OT and my speech therapist, therapist are being pulled to cover other class so how do i get at my service how do my friends and get those even those are going in person. even though they're going in person well who is going to well, who is going to make sure this section can get made up Nobody. This could all have been oh. avoided if we just us got our remote options. I miss my teachers. I miss my school. But I don't trust this mayor or the chancellor. And I don't and I don't plan to risk my life to pro to prove that I that I'm right. Thank you for the time. I want to thank you for again doing incredible, powerful things. Uh, again, I speak as a teacher. I, I would have high school seniors uh, that would you know uh, public speaking. Some, sometimes it, it's work in progress how wonderful and how powerful you, you, you're here today at, at a council hearing for everyone to hear you and support you. So I applaud and thank you so much for your powerful testimony because it really, you're speaking, you are, you are speaking on behalf of not just yourself and your family, but on behalf of your peers and fellow students and families as well. Thank you for your powerful testimony. Thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Paulette. Your time will begin. Paulette, I actually can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, council members, for holding this, the DOE accountable with this legislation on attendance and enrollment numbers. As New York City families keep their children home for safety or are still awaiting approval for home instruction, they continue being harassed by school and sometimes district and borough attendance agents, despite continuous communication with the schools on the status of their applications or their right to strike. This week, we have reports of ACS contacting families who have kept their children home for safety from schools in the Bronx, two different districts in Queens, and in Gravesend in Brooklyn. Without transparency on attendance, the DOE continues to downplay the over 100,000 families that have refused to, that the, that the DOE has refused to service. At yesterday's New York State Senate hearing, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson disputed Senator Liu's calculation of 144,000 students not receiving educational supports, as she did today with Councilman Traeger's estimate of 150,000 students, but still will not provide the enrollment numbers the DOE is using as its denominator to establish the 12% of children not attending schools. This is just another example of the lack of transparency and the way that the DOE is manipulating data to overshadow their responsibility and shrug the, the, the responsibilities that they owe these families. The approach just Deputy Chancellor Robinson stated to re-engage our families who are not sending their children in 
is the top-down only approach and is obviously not being implemented by our administrators if ACS is being called on parents now. How many more examples of this top-down approach by DOE central administrations failing do our families need to endure before we change these systems? Lastly, since Councilman Traeger mentioned pupil transportation could be its own oversight hearing, I implore you to do so. The atrocities that have been happening with pupil transportation still run amok today. We still have District 75 students still waiting for routes, uh, waiting for bus drivers to pick up their routes in order to bring them to school. And with academic recovery programs that are expected to roll out by November, it is against the law to prohibit access to these started. programs. Do you mind if I just finish real quick? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, uh, academic recovery programs are expected to roll out by November, and it is against the law to prohibit access to these programs due to the lack of transportation. But that is what 26,000 of our D75 students are facing, since 90% of our students get bussed out of their communities and will not have the luxury of some of our other IEP students of going to their local schools in order to get these related services or these academic supports. Please help us in calling for uh, more oversight over the Office of Pupil Transportation. And please partner with us to make sure that the systems that are in place now that are failing get revamped so that our families get the voices and the rights and the supports that they have been clamoring for for over two years. Thank you. Thank you, Paulette. And next we'll hear from Liz Rosenberg, Press NYC. Your time will begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so I usually really work hard on my testimony, but this, I really didn't because I feel that this is basically theater. Um, so here goes my mediocre testimony that the DOE and the DOH will never hear or care about. I'm a member of Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools, Press NYC. In this role, I've focused on a lot on data and research to try and offer families both a better sense of the risks of the science and to call out the flaws in the city's narrative about COVID in our schools and city. Here's some of today's data. IS-7 in Staten Island has 12 partial classroom closures. That's about 10% of their functional rooms, 123. They had four student cases on October 4th and on October 5th, three new students and one new teacher case. It's unclear if any of these cases came in via in-school testing because on the DOE's page, it says 0% of their results are back for October 4th. How could this have gone differently? A baseline test at the beginning of the year would have picked up thousands of cases that never would have gotten into our schools. To some portion of these students are not and cannot be vaccinated given this, um, given this, all of them should be quarantined. Poor ventilation is a factor in determining close contacts and we have no verification of the safety of any of these rooms. And I will also of course bring up the nose to nose rule. This school could be testing, whether that's in school or out, this appears to be a serious outbreak. If the focus is stopping spread, this is the time for the greater testing ability the DOE says that it can pivot to. For lots of students are in quarantine at IS-7 right now. How are they learning? Connected, especially special education students. Back to the data. Press NYC launched a people's dashboard this week to help us track whether case numbers are rising. Um, you can type tiny URL slash people's dashboard all over case. Time is expired. I, will, I just have a couple, I have one more paragraph action. Um, this is not public health, transparency, or any kind of good intentions toward our children and their school experience. This is about political ambition and controlling a narrative. I sincerely hope that we don't lose control of the narrative in the worst possible way loss of life, but signs tell us that there'll be more than 29 child deaths in New York City um, that New York City has already sustained. Yeah. Thank you. And next uh, we will hear from, and I apologize for messing up the name, Kalira Salas, uh, Press NYC CEC4. Yeah, you did pretty good, Malcolm. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Dr. Kalira Salas. I am currently the president of CEC4 and also on the steering committee of Press NYC. I have so many things to say as a scientist, a medical educator, parent, leader in my community, 
that this statement will definitely not do justice to my complete dismay and shock of the negligence displayed today by the Department of Education and the Department of Health. The fact that the city will not share enrollment data or accurate numbers of vax rates among students, however, still wants us to accept their decisions in changing mitigation protocols and non-pharmacological interventions in our schools is absolutely irresponsible. It perplexes me that they print a daily percentage of attendance for every school and an overall average, but they don't know the actual numbers. To be honest, as a CEC member, I have received actual numbers from my superintendent, so I do know that they have them. I'm also very confused how they can say that 92,000 plus students have signed consent forms and that they're all from unvaccinated students yet they don't know how many vaccinated students we have in the system. Eliza Shapiro apparently has the ability to, percent, um, to report percentages of vaccinated students, along with the fact that Black and Latino students have the least vaccinated uptake vaccine rates um, in, this, in, this, in our public school system. Our communities, East Harlem included, has struggled with vaccine access, as well as healthcare access on both testing and vaccination. 3% of my students in East Harlem stayed remote and only 1,200 students participated in Summer Rising. All of my families have asked for a remote option and lots are participating in the strike for safe schools. The first school that was closed was in my neighborhood. And so we have to acknowledge that school buildings are not safe. Two schools closed over the summer and Summer Rising. CEC4 has drafted and presented several resolutions to support not just weekly testing in schools, but if families do not want to test in schools, we have asked that they provide um, a COVID-free test in order to come into school buildings. We also would like to adhere to the six feet CDC guidance for social distancing in our the schools. The time has expired. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, if our principals and our teachers have the capacity to be test and trace agents, they should also have the capacity to make a determination of what's safe in their school buildings. We as a CEC have also established forums for, for a culturally responsive approach towards vaccination. And we went from a community that was barely vaccinated to 70% vaccination rate. That is what the DOE needs to do. And so we need to have, um, I also wanna highlight that we have a system that predominantly services Black and Latino communities. Data from the CEC shows that 20% of Black students have lost a parent. 10% of cases of COVID cases in children are Black children. 9% are Latino children. So we are literally creating a situation where we are putting in danger our most vulnerable communities, and we're not doing it in a culturally responsive way. So not only do we need a remote option, we need smaller class sizes, we need robust testing, we need ventilation, and we do need vac vaccination mandates that keep in mind these culturally responsive practices. And I can definitely provide names of physicians as well as scientists that have not been bought by the mayor that can bring clarity to the appropriate mitigation factors that we need to have in our schools to best protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. And I do want to remind council members that are still present in uh, the virtual room with us that if they have any questions for a particular panelist, just use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you when that panel has concluded. Um, for our next panel, uh, we will be hearing, we're first going to hear from Tanisha Grant, Parents Supporting Parents, New York. Um, so if we could go ahead and unmute Tanisha Grant, please. Hello, thank you so much, Councilman Trigger, for holding this very important oversight hearing on um, remote learning and um, this gold safety measures that's being taken place in our school. Um, I wanna talk to you about some of the parents um, in our PSPNY community and the stories they have. Just this morning, one parent hit me um, up about the fact that her school needed five substitute teachers and zero showed up. Um, yesterday, we had to advocate for a parent in Queens who um, got a visit from ACS um, for um, education neglect when she's keeping her son home for um, safety measures. These are just the type of stories that I get all the time, um, council members, about what's going on. Um, 
I am literally shaking right now from listening to the DOE lie to us for the last three hours. Um, our babies are the last thing that they are thinking about keeping safe and the pressure that is being put on our families, the anguish that they are going through after perhaps losing somebody from COVID in their families and being told that they must send their children to school, whether they have underlining conditions and other things of that nature. As my colleague before me, Kalira said from Press New York City, who we work closely with, um, a lot of our students are suffering from trauma and we just don't understand how it is trauma informed, how it is social, emotional learning um, to force all of our children back into school. They are lying to you about how many families are striking. Um, I have not sent my school, son to school not one day since school has started. I believe as you know, I advocate to my parents that there are a lot of things that we are talking about right now that were in place before COVID-19. We had problems with ventilation. We had problems with smaller class sizes. We had problems with adequate teachers and with what in a culturally responsive curriculum and education. We need for the DOE to not be reactive to not wait for one of our children who are being forced back into school to die before we get what we are asking for as you know um black and brown parents and asian parents on the ground that we get a remote learning option now thank you thank you for your testimony and next we will hear from Jennifer Goddard, the New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. go ahead. Your okay, time great, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, council members. Uh, Chair Traeger, always nice to see you again. Thank you for continuing to hold, as everyone has said, the DOE and City Hall accountable, no matter how much they try to spin it. My name is Jennifer Goddard. I'm the parent of a public school student who has an IEP and is currently at home in medically necessary instruction because he has severe asthma and an overactive immune system disorder. And I am here on behalf of the New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together, NYC CEPT. It has been extraordinarily hard to listen to the propaganda vomited here today. 70% um, of the students were not physically present in schools last year because we had a remote option. So I wish they would frame everything with that in mind. A lot of speakers have already touched on the things that are uh, shared, the concerns that are shared by us. So I'd briefly like to talk about what the gold standard looks like for two particular populations of New Yorkers, medically fragile students and uh, parents who are keeping their children home um, out of safety concerns at this time. My son is currently at home in an outschool.com math lesson because I've had to pay out of pocket um, because he only receives one hour of instruction from the Department of Education in medically necessary instruction. This is because the New York State Department of Education has a regulation that says that they have to offer a minimum of one hour. But I question how the first deputy chancellor can tout a gold standard when there are medically fragile students who physically cannot get a vaccine or be in school, how that's a gold standard getting one hour of instruction. He's received exactly 11 hours of learning since September 13th, which doesn't even equal two full school days. I wanna bring another important issue that a lot of people have touched on, which is the fact that ACS is calling parents who have uh, kept their children home out of safety concerns, including parents from District 75 who are experiencing severe bus issues. Uh, despite the fact that these parents have kept in contact with their schools, they have started getting calls from borough district offices and attendance teachers threatening them with ACS. Um, we alerted the media to this. The media reached out to the Department of Education and they denied that it happened. This has even happened to one of our parents who has a 14 year old daughter at home who, because she caught COVID during the second week of class and then not yet return because she has, has symptoms. So I just wanna implore you to please look closely into these statements that have been made today. Lying under oath is something that the committee should not take lightly. And I implore us to consider the gold standard that it should include a remote option. This is gonna address a lot of the problems that we've been talking about today. Staff shortages, unsafe classrooms, overcrowded classrooms, students who can't get vaccinated and the virus being transmitted throughout our city. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And next we'll hear from Amy Sai, New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together. Your time will begin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mark Traeger and members of the Educational Committee at City Council. Um, my name is Amy Sai. I am a parent of five New York City public school students currently in school um, in the Bronx um, in several different school settings, um, achieving their academic needs. I'm also the vice president of the New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together, and also a CEC member for our Citywide Council for District 75 Special Needs Community. I testified today with other parents and advocates on this platform. I want to encourage that there is a strong push for remote options to be restored back to our students. As yet heard today, the trust that we have in the Department of Education and the trust we have in Department of Health has been a failure. There has been no plan, no plan till the time right now. There, we're still in a COVID pandemic and yet a, a normal to what was normal before the pandemic was a challenge and the no, a new normal has not been existing right now. So, you know, we had heard a lot about issues of District 75 students, shortage of bus staff and bus uh, routes that students are still currently still seeking. So students are technically still at home until they are given those assignments um, back onto our buses with a one-to-one -one crisis pair or medical para. We also have the situation of our protocols in school. As you know, there is a uh, bi-weekly to a weekly testing for students that are 10% unvaccinated, uh, con um, consented to vaccinations. And we had heard today 192,705 finally filed, but that's not enough for a million students. Again, uh, communications to parents have been a lesser lack from what was last school year fall of um, the guidance and protocols. Uh, in regards to the situation rooms, isolation rooms no longer exist. And so how do we ensure that our children are actually I'm safe and health at top one? So I appreciate this opportunity to say our social needs and our most vulnerable children are at stake right now. And to really consider a remote option with playing real lives on our children rather than politics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. And our final panelist for this panel is Rashida Brown Harris the Healing Centered Schools Working Group. Your time will begin. Peace and blessings, everyone. My name is Rashida Brown Harris. I'm a parent leader with PAC, Parent Action Committee, and the Healing Center Schools Working Group. Um, the Healing Center Schools formed a task force um, in June 2021 in response to decades of educational inequity and childhood trauma impacting New York City students injustices exasperated by COVID-19, which we all know. The task force unites students, educators, parents, community groups, mental health providers, and elected officials to study how the city can implement healing-centered educational practices. The task force convened to identify and demand steps the city must take over the next year to remove harmful practices from public schools and build structures that support staff wellness, parent involvement and student growth and healing. Talking about oversight, DOE's changes in COVID protocols and implementation of the vaccine mandate, we need DOE to focus on healing centered schools. We've yet to hear back from DOE about the recommendations that we've submitted to them. Recognizing the trauma all of our students and school staff have experienced or are currently experiencing and exposing them to further harm and more trauma with these poor protocols and policies in place with talk about social emotional learning and talk of restorative and healing center practices is not adding up. Removing our school staff in a blink of an eye from our students and our school community overall is harmful. It's traumatizing. Calling ACS on our families because they're keeping their children home at this moment as they beg for a remote option is criminal. But continuing to not allow remote option for our families who are asking for it is, is asinine. Um, to continue to not prioritize funding and resources for more counselors, not cops, to not prioritize funding and resources for more devices and connectivity for remote learning, to not prioritize funding and resources expired. for COVID testing. Y'all, we need support, encouragement, and understanding. and build trust about the vaccine for our community members, not punitive and criminalization and shaming, to not prioritize funding and resources for culturally responsive education, language justice, 
and cultural competence in this time and not invest in smaller class size amidst this pandemic is criminal, it's irresponsible, and it's unconscionable. Um, Councilman Metro, please help us to work with the Healing Center Schools Working Group, to work with DOE, to work as city officials to really just focus on healing. We all need it. You know we do. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think uh, Councilman Riley had his hand up for a question. Yes, he does. If we can go ahead and unmute Councilmember Riley. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. And I just want to echo uh, what Ms. Rashida um, Harris stated. I was one of the elected officials that were actually working with the Healing Task uh, Center Task Force. Um, and we did come up with a lot of great ideas. And if you remember uh, Chair Traeger at the first committee hearing, I did ask the chancellor and the DOE if they did look at them and they stated that they did and would get back to us it is now October 6th. And I don't believe anyone has gotten back to us about anything as of yet, or we didn't have any further comment. Let's make sure that we unmute yep. Council Riley yep. and, and restore you. Thank you. Council Riley, just give us a second. For some reason, you got remuted. Just one moment. So sorry. Uh, there I, we I don't go. know. What, I don't know where I ended off at, but um, I, I definitely just want to uh, echo Ms. Rashida uh, because we definitely came together as elected officials, parents, uh, a lot of stakeholders to give uh, the DOE uh, uh, just some recommendations to, to make sure our schools are safer for our students and our parents and our teachers and educators. Uh, I did mention this at the uh, first hearing that we had with the chancellor when we had it in person. Uh, the DOE stated that they did receive these recommendations and we will be having further conversations. It is now October 6th and we haven't had those conversations yet. So definitely uh, just calling on them, um, encouraging them, please, uh, let's have further conversations because our schools des desperately need us. And thank you, Ms. Rashida um, and the rest of the Healing uh, Task Force for definitely their hard work uh, for these recommendations. Uh, thank you, Councilman Riley. And also, yeah, Councilman Riley is correct that they have not followed up on uh, critical matters. But I also just wanna say, yes, uh, DOE has a lot more work to do. Uh, the Department of Health, in, in my opinion, has made uh, negligent decisions uh, and uh, certainly changing things on the fly, uh, certainly not regaining or maintaining trust. But I, the buck stopped at the top. I hold the mayor accountable. Uh, he's in charge. And so, you know, the chancellor respectfully is not a public health expert. Um, I certainly am not. Um, and there's been a history of political interference with the health department, hence why we lost the previous health commissioner, quite frankly. Um, and so the buck stops at the top and I, and I hold the mayor accountable. But thank you uh, for your powerful testimony. Thank you to my colleague, Councilman Riley. And Malcolm, with that, we'll be here for the next panel. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize again um, for name mispronunciations. The next panel will be Gina Rotundo and Christina Kosia. The panel after that will be Tazan Azad, Michelle Russo, Anthony Beckford, and Mark Gonzalez. Uh, we will first start with Gina Rotundo. Your time will begin. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So I don't understand why families who do not require a remote option are taking precedence in the Department of Education's planning. How does this represent a gold standard? Where is the equity and excellence in removing an option that so many families chose last year? Clearly that is a preference even to require to ensure that their family and their community is safe. Why are they being punished for this? Many school buildings in the New York City Department of Education are not safe and they're not safe for unvaccinated or vulnerable children and staff. As the number of COVID cases are rising, they have exploded among children in districts that return to in-person learning. This is a preventable public health disaster and we're not doing anything to prevent it. Um, many historically marginalized students and communities have found solace in virtual learning. For a lot of kids, it was actually a better option. For the DOE to continually say that they know what is best for every single child is an outright lie. It is not one size fits all. It should have never been, nor should it be going into the future, as we've come to recognize that virtual learning was actually a better option for many of our students. Many students who didn't have to face bullying or who found themselves with 
certain behaviors in schools that had always been shunned and criminalized, such as cultural hairstyles, clothing, the use of informal speech and languages other than English, the social and emotional needs that do not fit into the mold of what is considered normal behavior were often met with over-policing instead of care. The absence of a remote option is criminal in my opinion. What does mandated in-person learning with no remote option and a lackluster health guidance mean for these people who are immunocompromised, for our pregnant and nursing guardians and staff members, for students with disability, for students in temporary housing, for multilingual families who have continually been the last to receive pertinent COVID-19 information? What does it mean for families of our youngest learners Your for whom vaccinations expired. are not yet required? The solution is a centralized remote option that prioritizes social emotional learning, a culturally responsive curriculum, and allows for student voice, parent empowerment, and teacher autonomy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next we'll call on Christina Kosia. That was a pretty good job at my last name. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Um, your time will begin. Right before I get started, I do want to say to the parents who are speaking right now, I think it speaks volumes that the representatives from the Department of Education, along with the representatives from the Department of Health, have already exited this meeting. Um, that being said, I think I stand on a little bit of a different platform. I'm speaking to you as a um, educator of 16 years who is now on leave without pay. Um, I do agree that there should be a remote option for for students um, as there should be a remote option and a respect for medical exemptions, religious exemptions, and for people's personal doctor's opinions on the vaccine, especially considering where we stand in terms of science and medicine and prophylaxis. Um, for 12 months straight, I have worked in person. It was 12 months because our summer special education pre-K program, pre program was severely short-staffed. And as our dedicated special ed teachers and providers were physically, mentally, and emotionally drained from a roller coaster of a school year, and took, they decided to take the summer off. Every day, myself and colleagues spent hours of unpaid time trying to find daily coverages to safely provide for our most delicate students to make sure we meet their entitled education and federally mandated services. I can tell you that in the six weeks of the summer program, testing for COVID, showed up maybe two to three times, despite giving the DECE a list of all those employed during the summer on day one. That was my responsibility. Let me be frank, even the protocols, PPE, social distancing during the regular school year was very much so smoke and mirrors. Despite that, my pre-K center only faced one closing due to a person that tested positive from a contact after they were forced to stay home with a person who was ill. On day eight of their quarantine is when they had tested positive. Suddenly the DOE is on a sprint for health, forcing unvaccinated teachers into leave without pay, claiming to have staff covered in the buildings, pulling unexperienced central staff out of their supportive the has inspired. only for them to be placed in a classroom. Let's be honest, the vacancy, I beg you two more seconds, the vacancy list on Subcentral has been blasted all over social media, and so have the complaints, walkouts, and mispreparatory periods of teachers and unqualified subs. It is no secret that the DOE is out of COVID compliance, but more so, they are out of regular city, state, and federal compliance, not to mention the rise in weapons and school attacks with a decrease of SSA. Schools ridden with asbestos, lead in water, lead in paint, broken air conditioners, no heat, decaying infrastructure. The list is miles long with the SCA, but now you think there's a problem. Now I am not good enough to run my pre-K center to continue to serve the low-income community of Sunset Park as, as I have done for the past six years. DOE has much bigger problems than my 40 years of impeccable health. The disease is one you breed, Department of Ed and you are infecting our city's children with this rushed mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. Um, for our next panel, it looks like Tazin dropped off, so we will circle back to her. So we will first start with Anthony Beckford. Your time will begin.
Thank you. I'd like to thank um, Chair Traeger and um, the rest of the committee for bringing this hearing here today. Um, I know it's a very strenuous um, time for all of us, especially parents and teachers. Uh, my name is Anthony Beckford. I'm a community leader in the Flatbushy Flatbush area, as well as a single father of a nine-year-old daughter and the president of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn. I'm here today to testify in regard to the lack of safety in our schools for teachers and students. I'm not talking about the deflective statement of safety that the mayor and chancellor both keep pushing about unvaccinated teachers because these are the same teachers who risk their lives and watch their colleagues and family members lose their lives when the mayor failed to protect our schools during the height of the pandemic. I'm talking about the disastrous reopening of schools, the failure to provide a remote learning option, keyword option, the unsafe and negligent rollback of the quarantine protocols and reckless decisions being made for political optics for the to, to be the first at reopening using last year for an example in for of in school success is very dangerous and inaccurate due to the fact that there are very small amount of students in school last in last school year the mayor chooses to use a remote option for his press conferences but yet denies students and parents a remote learning option truly hypocritical the rollback on the quarantine protocols in our schools goes against science and for those like the mayor and chancellor who keep telling us to follow the science, they are being hypocritical, being hypocritical by not following the science themselves. The already unsafe conditions in our schools, such as lack of adequate ventilation, overcrowding leading to no social distancing about 96% of the time, no testing to minimal testing at many of the schools, and now the rollbacks have caused many teachers to leave even before there was a vaccine mandate. These unsafe conditions are what have caused parents to do what they are supposed to do to protect their children since it is their right. But yet, instead of opening the, your ears and adhering to the demands and valid concerns, the mayor, chancellor, and DOE continues to weaponize a known enemy to the black and brown community, which is yeah. ACS. If anything, the mayor, if anything, the mayor, chancellor Porter, and whoever else is in complicit in all these needs to be immediately investigated for child endangerment. Let's live this. Mr. Beckford, I can no longer hear you. Uh, Mr. Beckford, can you repeat your closing statement? Because we can't, we couldn't hear the, the ending. I think his headphones may be unplugged, it looks like. In the past, I found out, oh. which is usually gold, as in this so-called gold standard is actually fool's gold. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tazin Azad is back on, so we will uh, turn to Tazin. We can go ahead and unmute her. Your time is going to begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, I'm so sorry, you're my side. That's okay. I have my kids. Um, Fool's gold is right. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Chair Traeger, for holding this hearing. I think we have we can decisively conclude that today's testimony that DOE and its partners presented um, it only succeeded in one thing, and that is to constantly maintain school communities in a state of confusion. Thank you, Tra Chair Traeger, for recognizing the frust frustration of parents who, from the onset of the pandemic, have undertaken all relevant preventative measurements to keep their families and the community at large safe. Consider a pre-K or a kindergarten classroom. Children are having lunch in class every day unmaxed for more than 15 minutes. Under the current guidances, no one in that classroom will ever be tested. How can this keep our students safe? In our district, we can, uh, we can, um, we had a random testing sample where the entire, where, which was entirely made out of teaching staff. How is this, how is this considered a legitimate data point? We have schools where school communities are never alerted of ongoing COVID interventions and receiving those notices in various languages are never heard of. How can this protect and uh, help prepare us to protect our communities? As useless as they are, printed health screens, which has been modified numerous times without the informing parents, spe specifically those who speak languages other than English, and now we can't see uh, other than English. And now we could see in real time the aftermath of an ill planned vaccine mandate where our special education students are being taught by unlicensed special education teachers. This is neither keeping our children safe nor is it providing them with a safe, equitable education. All of this only reinforces the claim that DOE's COVID safety protocol is, uh, is 
in place not to prevent a case from entering the school or from in school spread. In fact, it is a concerted effort by the DOE and the city to deny the demand of majority of black and brown underrepresented Asians, and multilingual and immunocompromised students for a remote option. It is unforgivable that the city and the DOE has failed to recognize the realities of our families. And I can Your only tell you that we the parents, and I could only tell you that we the parents have long memories and we will not forget. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And next, we will hear from Mark Gonzalez. Your time will begin. Council Member Traeger and other council members, thank you um, for holding this hearing and all the other hearings you have had on this serious subject. Uh, my name is Mark Gonzalez. I'm a parent of a nine year old and a recently partially val uh, vaccinated 12 year old. Uh, you can't wait till he can get his second shot. His birthday uh, for 12 was getting his uh, vaccine. So, you know, a good start for him. Um, but both my kids were remote last year and they thrived in the environment. I wish they could have been remote this year um, for their safety and the safety of others. One of my children is at a significantly higher risk of severe COVID based on New York State Department of Health and CDC data. And yet one hour a day is not a comparable education. And so I am risking his life, frankly, to get him in school. Um, but I'm very concerned what's happening today. The mayor and the DOE are treating five to 11 year olds the same as vaccinated 18 year olds. Problem is my nine year old can't get it. He's begging to get it. We tried to get him um, early, we can't. And my 12 year old's still not eligible for a second shot as he's uh, two weeks uh, in, into his 12th year. You know, having the same policies for all students is just plain insane. We should have significantly stronger safety measures in place for elementary school students as they cannot be vaccinated. To just continue saying vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate don't work for my nine-year-old. It certainly doesn't work for four and five-year-olds in kindergarten right now. And in fact, the New York City Department of Health tweeted out today that five to 12-year-olds are experiencing higher cases of COVID compared to the citywide averages. In fact, it's the highest rate of all age groups in New York City. The New York City Department of Health data actually shows infections for 100, per 100,000 have skyrocketed 41% for the five to 12 age group since school has started. It's now up to 186.87 people per 100,000, by far the highest of any age group in New York City and the only age group that has gone up since school started and continued going up. So why are these rates skyrocketing? The DOE decreased safety requirements this, this year. My nine-year-old school- Councilmember Traeger, can I please continue? Thank you. My nine-year-old school, only 52% of the families have been given consent to be tested. That, I mean, while that's okay, last year was 100% had to. They said, the first deputy chancellor said that 170 odd thousand, 192,705 had given consent. Well, that's only 21% of the city's Department of Education students based on the data the city had to send to the state of New York. State of New York says we have 898,053 students in school. So 21% have given their consent at this time. Last year, testing was 10% of all healthy students weekly. Now it's 10% of the families that want to be tested who are healthy. This is not a random sample as Dr. Lawn said. This is testing with self-selection bias. The same way that last year's in-school testing was a sample of only healthy students who passed the daily screening form. The data they are giving is inaccurate. The DOE also cut notification requirements for COVID this year. Last year, families were told if there was a COVID case in the classroom. Now we will only know if there's a positive case in school. The New York City Department of Education and DOH actually believe that lice is a higher safety risk than COVID, as we will be notified if there is a lice case in our classroom, but not for COVID. How does that make sense? When we know COVID can last in the air for 14 hours. Dr. Lawn today mentioned properly fed masks earlier, yet in the last education council hearing, council member Traeger that you had, the DOE chancellor and her staff said that K N95s and KF94s would be made available to order. Our custodian has tried repeatedly as has our principal and been denied every time. We've been told N95s are only available for our building response team. We have also been told we could get air purifiers Yet we were told the large air purifiers are not available and our schools actually had to move 
air, small air purifiers out of rooms to put into the cafeteria to do our best to keep our children safe. It's no, one, no longer a wonder why the New York City attendance isn't being told. It's clear that the data shows we had more than 121,000 students not attending yesterday based on the state data and the city percentage they gave. This is not leadership. This is a mayor running for governor and a city leadership that has failed our students and our families. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you, and that concludes the panel. Uh, that concludes the testimony for this panel. Next, we will hear from Tracy L. Gray, Melissa Kay, Lauren Clavin, Tom Weirman, and Aaron Lawson. Following that panel will be Angie, Connie Montesino, Etta Jean Singletary, and Jasmine Del Valle. We will start with Tracy L. Gray. Thank you, Chair. We'll begin. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for holding space for us to speak. I come to you as a former early childhood teacher, a school leader, and current education collegiate faculty member. I have great respect for the teaching profession and for educators. I share these anecdotes with my daughter's consent. My daughter is a senior in a New York City public school. Her father passed away from COVID in December and she has been grieving, grieving deeply. This deep grief led to serious depression and she's under a doctor's care. Prior to COVID, my daughter was an incredibly engaged student. With support from her doctors and therapists, she returned to school in person last week. She's enrolled in two classes, one where there is no teacher and the other which takes place at the end of the day. So not really having any school at all. I'm concerned that there is no empathy or sensitivity training for teachers dealing with students who have been traumatized during this pandemic. Here's one example. On Monday, my daughter arrived at school after returning from her doctor's appointment. As instructed, she went to the library where students who do not have class are required to gather. Students were playing in the library and someone threw an object across the room. The teacher in the library immediately accused my daughter of disrupting the class. My daughter and her friends insisted she did not cause the disruption. The teacher demanded that she leave the library and she refused. He immediately said that she was disrespecting him and insisted that she call me. Upon receiving the call from the teacher, I had to de-escalate the situation. I quickly walked to the school to make sure that my daughter was okay. It took a great deal for my daughter to return to school and hoping for a safe, safe environment. At this point, my daughter is discouraged and not able to, re to return to in-person learning. I requested a hybrid or remote option for her senior year and the principal responded saying that there is no, quote, there is no remote or hybrid New York City DOE school, high school option in school year 2021. I need, time has I need a remote option for my child for her senior year, and I want remote options for every family member who requests. Thank you for your testimony. And next, we will hear from Melissa Kay. Uh, hello, thank you all for uh, providing this platform for. Sorry, uh, hello? You can go ahead, we can hear you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I was, I was gonna, I have my daughter uh, right now, and then uh, my hero over here wanted to uh, speak, so you have the floor. I do not want to go to school because if somebody tests positive, now do we have to stay home or they're just not going to tell us? And now the door is closed and now all of us are breathing in a lot of things. And that's how you get it. And then you have mass breaks and now... You have to eat inside, everybody is breathing in. You may feel good now, but then you may feel good now, but a couple of days later, now you're not. Okay. So, uh, so I, I want to say, I, 
I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch her name. Uh, your name is Melanie. How old are you? Yeah. What grade are you in? Well, I, I want to say thank you so much. And I'm so proud of you. As I mentioned with the uh, earlier student, it takes so much courage to do what you just did. And you speak on behalf of so many of your other classmates and peers and friends fighting for safety and support in the right education. Uh, and so I want to applaud you and say A plus. Thank you so much for your powerful. You, you may continue. Thank you. Um, so um, again, to add to, um, so we, we, we appear to be the families that are, are not spoken of, we're unseen and we're unheard. So I call my daughter my hero because um, last year, April, in the height of the pandemic, I lost my dad. And the unbelievable grief and trauma um, caused me to have multiple seizures. At the time, my eight-year-old daughter had to dial 911 and allow the paramedics into her home. So this happened not once, but twice to us. So we have a personal connection. We have that trauma um, that goes with um, COVID. And now to just expect her to, to go into the classroom and everything is, is normal and it's fine. Um, it, it is not. You know, um, we're commuting by two trains to get to school. So that is also an additional risk for, for our families. Um, you know, removing COVID, COVID protocols um, at this point where we have a much more transmittable and infectious virus, it doesn't help, um, especially for elementary school age children where we have a higher population of all the children in the school who can't be vaccinated. They had so much to say, but <laughs> um, so I, I thank you for this platform to, to be able to speak and 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 give our our standpoint. But also um, with with these things where we we hear um, DOE officials speaking and giving us details, and it's just not enough to make families feel safe. And then when we take you know steps to offer the overall uh, physical and mental health of our children uh, by staying home because contrary to what has been said, school is not the safest place for my child. Um, so when I keep her home, I am now being with more stress of calls about ACS, of potential of, of, of neglect for not sending her to school. But when I ask for work for my child, I am being denied. So who is really neglecting her of an education. Thank you. Um, I want to. I want to thank you. I want to thank you because it, that it's very powerful, emotional, sobering testimony that really brings it home to what we're talking about here in this moment in space. Uh, the need to support families and meet them where they're at, to listen, to hear, um, and to make decisions that's mindful of the traumatic experience that's still on an ongoing basis. Um, and. It's, it, 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 it's, it's negligence on the part of the government. We, we need to call on them, on their negligence, um, that, that they continue to fail your child and continue to fail your family. Um, and so I, I'm sorry that you are uh, going through this. And I also wanna say, I mentioned this earlier, that there are, there are some schools that are providing options to kids and families at this time. And, I, and, and the fact that your school is not, the fact that the previous uh, person testified, I think Ms. Gray testified that they're not, that shows the inequity that's happening right now, even deeper inequity that's happening in our school system, where there are certain communities that have pivoted quietly to remote options, while others have not, and continue to neglect uh, to provide our kids and families the education and support that they need in this moment. So. Uh, we're going to continue the fight. And also this hearing, it's, it's more than just getting testimony. We are hearing bills that I am introducing in the council that will require more information from the DOE, info that they didn't have today, but they will soon be required to report. So I want to thank you for, your, for making a difference for your powerful testimony and for your daughter. I hear you, and we're going to continue to fight for you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. And next we'll hear from Lauren Clavin. Time begins now. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Council Member Traeger, for convening this hearing. And thank you for, for telling the truth and naming uh, the negligence that is going on. Thank you for, for telling it like it is, because that is what is happening. Um, my name is Lauren Clavin. I'm a public school parent in Queens, or at least I was. Um, and apologies in advance if my, if my voice shakes. It's because I'm furious after sitting here and listening to, the, to DOE and DOE, DOH officials lie and lie and lie. I am furious. And apologies also if you hear um, noise from some kids. Uh, that's because I had no choice but to keep my kids out of school this year. My children should be, they deserve to be in school, receiving the education that they are legally entitled to right now. But because the mayor decided not to provide a remote option this year, I had to choose between my asthmatic child receiving an education or staying alive. I chose his life. And contrary to what Dr. Long said earlier, my home is a lot safer for my young children who were still too young to be vaccinated than an overcrowded, poorly ventilated school building where distancing is not possible. And by the way, I'd love to know why this three feet measure is talked about so much. This virus is airborne, right? So anyway. Um, Dr. Long may be right when he said that schools were safe last year. Um, but assuming that's true, we're talking about pre-Delta times with a less infectious variant. And most importantly, because there was a remote option available last year, our school buildings were still at less than half capacity as of the end of last school year because most of our parents chose to keep their kids home. That's why it was safe. That way that, that's why there was less in-school spread. Let's not, let's not dance around that. The COVID-19 pandemic is not over. We know this variant is more contagious. We know it harms kids. Our schools are not safe enough. We need transparency from leadership. We need robust um, testing, real test and trace protocol. We need actual distancing, smaller class sizes. We need adequate PPE for students and staff, ventilation and air, air filtration, and we need a remote option now for those who want it. I grew up in Queens and I was always proud to say that I went to public schools from kindergarten all the way through CUNY, right? I've been an involved parent, volunteer in my child's school, PA, SLT, all of it. Uh, I'm an organizer and an advocate for equitable public schools in my community. I'm a fan of public schools, I'm a champion, right? So I've tried really, really hard to understand why there was no remote option provided this year and why there is less testing and fewer safety measures overall. But every conclusion that I've come to is really bleak. Maybe it's simple incompetence, maybe it's arrogance, maybe it's economically motivated. I don't know what it is. What I do know for sure is my trust in the system has been irrevocably broken. None of us would have chosen to homeschool our kids before this year or to keep them home without officially unenrolling at risk of being reported to ACS for educational neglect. Are you kidding me? We are in this horrible situation because the DOE and the mayor gave us only two choices, keep them home and beg for resources and assignments from their teachers or send them into a school knowing there's nothing but rhetoric and empty promises preventing them from getting COVID. I am furious, I am heartbroken to say this, but I don't know when I'll ever feel comfortable sending my kids back into the care of the DOE because the mayor has made it 100% clear that he does not value their lives. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Tom Weirman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Traeger. Hello, my name is Tom Weirman. I am a 20 year New York City teacher who has been put on unpaid leave for refusing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I wanna be clear, I am not anti-vaccine nor am I anti-science. I have a master's degree in science as so does my wife. I am friends with doctors, physicists, epidemiologists and many others who hold positions within the scientific world. I value their opinions greatly. That being said, science is not to be followed blindly as they believe many are doing so as it relates to the coronavirus pandemic. On, a, on August 23rd, Mayor de Blasio mandated that all New York City teachers and staff be vaccinated by September 27th or be placed on unpaid leave. One would think that in order to place a mandate such as this, 
the science should be settled on the given subject. It is clear the science regarding the coronavirus pandemic is anything but that. If something as powerful and absolute as a mandate can be placed on New York City teachers and staff because the science is clear, then can someone please explain to me how the use of masks has changed innumerable amount of time since the pandemic started? Can someone please explain to me how people who have gained natural immunity by having the virus itself are no better or equal to those who have gained immunity by taking the vaccine? Not to mention, we know natural immunity poses a stronger barrier to variants of the virus than the vaccine does. Can someone please explain to me how if the goal is to stop the spread of the virus, then why do we even allow vaccinated teachers and staff near children considering the vaccinated have proven not only to be, inf to, be, to be able to get the infection, but also to spread it themselves. Where is the science in that? Can someone ex please explain to me how our leaders in government can claim that one of the offered vaccine has FDA approval, when in reality, the only vaccines available in the country are still under emergency authorization use. And finally, can someone please explain to me why a vaccine should be forced upon anyone without even knowing the long-term effects of the drug. Most vaccines take anywhere from five to 15 years to be to develop. This one has only taken a few months. These are not the questions of a conspiracy theorist. They are the questions of intelligent and prudent people who want concrete long-term data available to them before making important decisions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And finally, for this panel, uh, we will hear from Aaron Lawson. Time begins. Aaron? Aaron, you're unmuted. You're able to begin your testimony. Okay, we will, um, we will come back to Aaron. Um, next, we are, our next panel, we are going to call on Angie. Clock is ready. Okay, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for your services and thank you for, you know, trying all you can do for our children. Um, well, I have my daughter here, and one day I told her you're going to school, and she was like, I'm not going to school, mommy. And, you know, she locked herself in the room, and she wrote me a letter. And she's here to read that letter to you all, okay? So, yeah, go, you go, go ahead and read it. My name is Angelina Sesame, and I'm 12 years old in the seventh grade. As much as I miss my teachers and friends and want to be in school, I am afraid to attend class in person. This pandemic has affected just not my family, but many families in the world. COVID-19 took my grandpa and my aunt. My family has been hit very hard. I miss my grandpa so much. This past year and a half has been has not been easy on me. I have I have and am still experiencing fears and worries that have led me to speak to a therapist and now a cardiologist is checking me for long QT. When my mom told me I have to attend school in person, I freaked out. The thought of me attending school and putting my family in danger is not okay with me. I know education is important, but our family is more important. My mom has multiple sclerosis and my four-year-old brother cannot get vaccinated. I understand how serious this virus is as I have lost family, mem family members due to it. And I am not ready to lose my mom or my brother to this monster just because Mayor Bill de Blasio wants me in school. My mom have, has kept us safe all this time and I will not take the risk of going back to school and catching something. I just wonder why Mayor Bill de Blasio is making it so difficult and not wanting to offer the remote option for those who want it. The schools are too crowded and making it impossible to social distance. If remote learning was offered, it will help a lot of students like myself and also the school because I know there will be a good number of students who will take remote learning and results to less students attending in school, making it better to social distance in school buildings. 
I wonder, doesn't Mayor Bo de Blasio see the increasing numbers and deaths? Why doesn't he do something before we end up in another wave? He needs to stop threatening the parents with ACS. The parents are not the parents are not neglecting our education, but instead protecting our health and keeping us kids safe. I've always thought ACS is for children that are being mistreated for not keeping kids safe. If that is the case, then we need to call ACS on the mayor and the school chancellor because they are the ones that don't care about our health and safety as they say they do. They don't care since they don't have young kids in school. Education will do us no good if our health is not 100%. I beg our mayor and school chancellor to stop being so selfish and ignorant. I beg them to please offer remote and remote learning option. Stop putting politics before pediatrics. Our health, our life, our safety, our choice. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. That I felt was very touching and very powerful from a child just for her to come and write that to me. And her looking out for me with MS and having, you know, lost my grand, my, my dad, which is grandpa and, you know, my aunt. It's been a very difficult, it's been very hard for us and not having remote and she did really good in remote and not having that as an option. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not cool. I just say it's not cool. We are, you know, it is a public school system. You should involve the public, involve the opinions of the parents. Don't take it just on yourself to make the ultimate decision. We need to protect our kids. And that's just the bottom line. And I'm at the point that I don't care if ACS knocks on my door because my child is my number one priority. And that's just that. Thank you for listening. I wanna thank you and your, and your daughter uh, for I tell you, this is some heavy, this is heavy. Uh, this is, I, I don't know who anyone's listening and not feeling it right, right here. And uh, this is very heavy. And I'm sorry that they continue to fail your daughter and continue to fail you and your family. It is negligence on their part. Uh, and I also want you to know that the New York State Education Department actually recognizes that in some cases, or, or a number of cases, uh, remote learning worked for kids because they actually put that into their guidance to school districts. Nothing prohibits, nothing prohibits the New York City DOE from providing remote option other than the arrogance and stubbornness of Mayor Bill de Blasio. The NYSED uh, guidance actually states that, you know, for, for those school districts that where there's kids that thrived or did okay with remote learning, continue making that an option for families. But this mayor chose, chose to fail the kids in, in our school families by, by failing to provide uh, this option. But we're, we're, not, we're not giving up. Uh, we have a lot more work to do and uh, thank you and, and for your daughter for the very powerful, very powerful testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Jasmine Del Valle. Time begins. Hey. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, if you hear some background noise, I have my three-year-old with me. She's not at school today. Um, and I have my school, my kids at school. I have a 3K year old and a third grader. For someone to say that my child is better at school, I completely disagree. My kids went a year and a half without going to school. They did remote learning. Not once did they ever get sick. Not once did they have a cough, stomach virus, or anything. The moment they went back into school, they've gotten sick three times. I had to rush them to a doctor to make sure that they wasn't COVID positive. Thank God to this day, each time they test the negative. My son had to go back to the doctor today because he got sick. So far, as of I know, I don't know if he has COVID or not because the urgent care that he went to aren't even doing testing. So my husband had to call me to say that he had to go somewhere else. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I stand with parents that want to make that choice to have a remote option. There's way too many kids in our schools. They're saying that they're only testing 10% of the kids. In my son's school, there's about 200 and something kids, which is a small school, but 10% makes only what, 20 kids. 
what what's gonna get determined with that? Nothing's gonna happen with just the amount of 20 kids being tested. So that's what I wanna say, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now we are uh, going to try Aaron Lawson again. Time begins. Aaron, you're unmuted. You are able to begin your testimony. Okay. Um, it sounds like she is not there. Uh, so our next panels that we will move on to is Connie Montesino. Clock is ready. Okay, um, we will move on to our next person, people have been coming in and out. So we will, at the end, do a catch all to make sure we captured everyone that may have dropped off the Zoom or had technical issues. So our next panelist that we are going to go to is Mar Fitzgerald. Sir, I came back on. Oh, I didn't- Oh, Connie? Unmute. Yes, I didn't unmute, oh. I'm sorry. I was out at the store and I didn't unmute. Does that that, that's okay. You can okay, go ahead and begin your testimony. You, yes, I don't want to take up you guys' time, but I just want to say thank you, everyone that's trying to you talk for us and speaking for us as far as we re remote learning. Um, my son, I have not seen come back to school this September. I didn't take him into school. Um, and I spoke to his assistant principal and the principal, and I told them my concerns. Um, he did very well on remote. Some kids don't. I, I get it. But my son is shy and he didn't raise his hand a lot when he was in school. I've been hearing that since he started first grade, but um, he's in the 10th grade right now. And I don't like my son being out of school, but he has been going to Google Classroom and he has been getting work from there. But it's, I know it's not the same as being in school or having the remote because he, he's not on there that long. He do his work and do what he has to do. And I have him reading and stuff at home. But um. That's, I just want to um, point that out that we do need remote learning. Um, like I said, it doesn't work for everyone, but um, we do need that because our kids are safer at home than in school. And then they had nerve telling us about the holidays are coming up. Okay, I haven't been with around my family, you know, and they fully vaccinated. But the thing is, Who's to say you still can't catch it? You can't catch it vaccinated or unvaccinated. And then you've been around in a classroom with kids you don't know, you don't know how their home life is, you know, and, and that's okay, that's safer? I don't think so. And I've been on here since 10.30 this morning and all I've been here from um, the doctors and they, they lying. They lying for their Maya. So I just want to state that and I'm done. Thank you, Connie. And next thank we will thank you. And next we will turn to Mar Fitzgerald. Um, hello, hi, my name is Mar Fitzgerald. I am a member of the Community Board 2 Schools and Education Committee. I'd like to share with you today a resolution that we passed unanimously at full board this past month uh, on resolution to support a remote learning option for the 2021-2022 academic year. And I'll, I'll share it digitally. Again, I already have actually, but I'll, I'll read the whereas. I mean, the re, therefore be it resolved on the resolution. Therefore be it resolved that Community Board 2 Manhattan implores the DOE to provide families with a synchronous, high-quality virtual learning and create a centralized option for families and staff throughout the 2021-22 school year, complete with student, guardian, and educator input to ensure families and staff have the option of staying home as we continue to badly battle this deadly disease. Therefore, be it further resolved that Community Board 2 demands any virtual option, synchronous or asynchronous, must be developed in collaboration with families and school staff to ensure remote learning students and families needs are addressed. All virtual learning options should be reviewed and approved by the SLT of each school. Therefore, be it further resolved 
that the Manhattan Community Board 2 demands the DOE allow students who choose 100 virtual 100 percent virtual learning have pre-established opportunities to return opt back in into in-person learning should the DOE prove it has the ability to keep students safe and that's all I have thank you so much Thank you, Barbara. We appreciate it. Uh, Aaron Lawson, I see your hand up. We're going to go back to you now. Clock is ready. Okay, Aaron, it looks like you're still having technical issues because we can't hear. You accepted the unmute, but we can't hear you. Um, we still have a few more people, so we will circle back. Um, next, we are going to turn to Maria Villobos. Clock is ready. Okay, um, we will next turn to Robert Scott. And for the people I'm calling on, when we unmute, when our staff, when our staffer unmutes you, you should see a pop-up window asking you to accept the unmute, which will then allow you to speak. Okay. Next, we will turn to Debbie Bertram. Hi. Okay, um, so we have called on everyone and uh, unmuted everyone, uh, but if folks don't wanna testify, that's okay. I would like to remind everybody that testimony in full uh, should be emailed to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We accept testimony for up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing. And if there is anyone that dropped off before and has just rejoined now and we have not called on you, just use the raise hand Zoom function. Seeing no hands raised, Chair, that concludes public testimony for this hearing. Uh, I wanna thank you, Malcolm. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Malcolm and uh, the extraordinary committee staff uh, and my staff uh, that, on, that put this together very, very quickly um, uh, for this hearing and also for drafting uh, bills. Uh, that we will be advancing here uh, in the city council to get a lot more data and transparency. Yes, we are under mayoral control here, but uh, one of you know, we have a couple of tools. One is oversight. Also, I think you've heard from my colleagues, uh, Councilman Riley, and who I, I appreciate so much for, for being here and with our schools every step of the way, but myself and others who speak to schools every day, and that's also part of the job, staying grounded, hearing the truth, uh, that's how I'm able to dispel or uh, counter the mayor's, I think, illusions on TV that every, every school is covered and the staff, everything is great, when in fact we still have schools that are short power professionals providing critical services to kids. And we have heard from parents and, and from children, students today, how the city is failing them uh, by, by, fa by failing to provide a reasonable uh, option, remote option. Uh, in the moment that we're in. Um, we will be advancing, working hard on trying to get uh, the, the data uh, if they will not give it to us. And we've asked more than once. We've asked for this data at previous hearing. We sent a follow-up letter and Malcolm, thank you for that as well. Uh, they have yet to give us the information that we need. They gave us some data, but still incomplete. We still need a whole lot more in in information. Um, and to the families uh, that are watching, uh, we see you, we hear you, keep sending those messages where we are, we're, we're, we're taking that back and we're continuing to make the case to the administration and to the public uh, of, of, of all the services that our kids rightfully deserve. Um, and, and the fact that uh, we heard some testimony today about the inadequacies even around home instruction, uh, how even if families were approved for medical accommodations for their children, that's insufficient. Um, and uh, we, we have a lot more work to do. And I also wanna go back to this. 
Uh, the chancellor is not a public health expert, although the DOE has a lot more work to do to give us information data. Especially, I will not accept an answer that they don't have attendance numbers. That, is, that just flies in the face of reality. They have it. They're just choosing not to share it uh, because the numbers are very sobering. Um, and again, this is, not, this is not a game of gotcha. It's not about embarrassing anyone. This is about our children. These, these numbers reflect lives, kids. And as a teacher, if, if a child missed one day of instruction, that was a lot. We're talking about now weeks, weeks. Um, and and this, this, is, this is an emergency. Um, there are schools I know that their attendance is 40%. 40%. It's, it's I mean, we, we, we're, we are not giving up on this fight. And we're going to continue to demand the information, accountability, transparency. Uh, but uh, some very heavy testimony today um, from, from, from uh, children, from parents, and, and from advocate stakeholders. And as far as the testimony we heard from administration, uh, just complete, complete disappointment. It, today's hearing uh, from administration did not instill more confidence. It actually eroded uh, confidence. It eroded further trust. Um, and it doesn't take a vaccine to, or any type of magic wand to build trust. Just be honest with people, level with the public, tell the public the truth. In crisis, you need to be as transparent as you can to maintain trust. And that's where they continue to fall short. Uh, and uh, uh, we will- Chair, we will... before you close it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but we're gonna try one last time because her hand <laughs> came up. Erin uh, Lawson. Miss, uh, Hello? Miss Lawson, yes, please, I'm sorry. Okay, we can hear you. Oh, Final, yay, yes. cool, yay. Oh my gosh. My, my 10 year old could have figured this out much quicker than I am. I'm so sorry, but thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here um, on, on this closing note. I would just like to read a letter that was left on my door yesterday by the ACS. It says, this is to inform you that you are the subject of a report of sub, sub, suspected child abuse or maltreatment received by the New York State Child Abuse and Maltreatment Register, in parentheses, State um, Central Register, on 9-29, 2021. This means that you have been identified as a person who is responsible for causing or allowing to be inflicted injury, abuse, or maltreatment to the, to the child. This report has been transmitted to the Queens County Child Protective Service for your commencement of an investigation and evaluation of the report as required by the New York State Child Protective um, Services Act. Now, this, has, this doesn't even say anything about educational neglect which is why I was even reported to the DOE in the first place. Now, I mean, this seems like, <laughs> this is like far beyond educational neglect. Like, I feel like I'm, you're, they, you're trying to stereotype me as a criminal, you know, for not wanting to take my child to school. Like, we all know that the pandemic is still going on. Everyone is all, following all these protocols and all these um, things like this. But for me, not being sure about, what's going on right now, being that, you know, we, they're not transparent with the data um, and, you know, so many other things that's going on. It, it's, it's not fair. You know, I mean, I'm, as you can hear, I'm frazzled. Like they keep calling to my house. Um, they're calling my phone. They came on Friday. They just came again on yesterday. They're, they're freaking harassing me. Like, this is, this is not fun. This is not, this is not fine. This is serious. Like, I just don't understand. Like, and like last year, let, you know, Last school year, which was only a couple months ago, my child's school had two cases where they had to shut down, you know, you know, when they had the blended learning, they already had to shut down. So now this this school year, which is only a couple months later, how am I supposed to feel confident in sending my kid back to the same school where you had two outbreaks before? And, you know, and I'm getting penalized for this. It's not even funny. Like my daughter, she gets up and, and has her same schedule every day. Like, as if she, I'm sorry, as if she was in school, you know, she gets up and has all her classes. I've, I've done what I can to even buy workbooks and all kinds of things for my daughter. And you're still trying to paint me out as, as, as a criminal. This is this is not going to work. And for there to be like 150,000 other kids that are, that are not in school, that's 150,000 suspected child abuses you have. And that's not a good look for New York City. You know what I mean? It, this is crazy. Like I'm so. Uh, this is this is this is not going to work. Like we really need to get a remote option because it's not fair that you have some options for other people and not for others. 
you know, all our kids need to learn. And, and not only that, we're all room learn, we all learn remotely every day. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's in somebody's house, at the grocery store or whatever, we're all learning every day, all the time. And for this, and we're not having to open for our kids to be safe in our environment where they can learn that is, is appalling. And we need to get this under, under control. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, don't be sorry. The, the, the city, we owe you an apology. Um, and, and it's shameful and outrageous that they posted that on, on your door. Uh, th- th- that's, that's a very frightening letter. Um, and uh, to a family to, that's already traumatized and going through day-to-day uh, concerns. Um, and I, I also w- wonder if uh, the ACS commissioner and the ACS folks contacted City Hall last year when they failed to provide kids remote devices a year in, into the school year, where we had uh, over 100,000 kids plus without devices, where they had virtually almost no connections with their school communities other than worksheets or packets. And I want to give a shout out. I know Tanisha Grant is, is still here, who on her own raised money and efforts from grassroots to get kids laptops, not waiting for the negligence and the, and the carelessness of the administration. Um, uh, ACS should be called on them. Uh, that, that, that really is, uh, that is outrageous. And, and again, the key words here is remote option. It's an option to give to the families in public. We recognize that there are certain children I've heard from families where in-person works better and that's great. But for, for, many, for, for many children and families, actually remote did, did work better. Families, there's still no vaccine for kids under the, under the age of 12. And uh, children who are immunocompromised and so forth. So this this is, uh, I, I, I also wanna just follow up with you, uh, Ms. Lawson, if, if you, if you uh, uh, have legal representation and if not, we can connect to try to make sure that we get you legal representation because it is outrageous that they posted that on, on your door. So if you wanna send uh, us an email, mtrager at council.nlc.gov, uh, I'd be happy to, to follow up with you afterwards. Thank you so much. I will definitely thank, do that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ms. Wilson, and thank you to everyone who uh, who testified, uh, who shared a very powerful, meaningful, meaningful testimony. We have a lot more work to do, uh, and after this Zoom meeting, uh, I will be making some additional phone calls uh, because this this is infuriating, um, and uh, this these are these are life and death decisions uh, for public health, also for education. Um, and, and the long-term well-being of our children. So thank you all, and I thank the committee staff for, for your work today as well. Thank you all. This hearing is adjourned.